Once upon a time, there was a wild pig and a sea cow. The two were best friends who enjoyed racing against each other. One day, the sea cow got injured and couldn't race any longer, so the wild pig carried him down to the sea where they could race forever, one on land and the other in the water. If you were born into the hunter-gatherer Aita community in the Philippines, you would have grown up listening to this story, and indeed no matter where you grew up in the world, most of us heard stories that echoed sentiments like this. While they may seem like mere fables on the surface, there's a lot to learn from them. Things like friendship, cooperation, and equality. In the past, stories like these permeated our culture from childhood to old age. But the world has changed a lot since our hunter-gatherer days. Stories that teach us about our sense of community are now limited to children's fables and no longer circulate through our culture as we get older. While in the past the job of passing on necessary life skills, history, and information was a collective effort, today, all of that power has been given to commercial media. In the words of George Gerbner, commercial media has eclipsed religion, art, oral traditions, and the family as the great storytelling engine of our time, and whoever tells the stories of culture gets to govern human behavior. And therein lies the biggest problem with commercial storytelling. Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, all the different news apps and websites, how many times do we check the news on our phones every day? In the past, it took weeks, months, or even years to hear bad news from the other side of the world. But today, we have everything at our fingertips. Wars, riots, chaos, scandals, the news feels inescapable. It's like we're trapped in a constant reel of negative information on all platforms and from every news outlet. If you strip it down to its roots, the message behind it all is always the same. One that plays on our emotions and instills fear in our hearts, warning us against a world filled with people who want to hurt us, ideologies that threaten ours, and unexpected events that are meant to keep us on high alert. But is the world really as bad as mass media wants us to believe? Or are we suffering from mean world syndrome? In the 1970s, Dr. George Gerbner first coined the term mean world syndrome, while conducting research on the effects of violent related content on our view of the world. His findings showed that a heavy diet of violence, whether through entertainment or the news, can lead to a sort of cognitive bias that makes us perceive the world as more dangerous than it actually is. What is the most interesting about Gerdner's research is that it doesn't matter whether we know the content we're consuming is factual, like a news report, or fictional, like a movie, the effect is the same. When we're constantly bombarded with negative information, we begin to develop a worldview that is highly skeptical, suspicious, and pessimistic. As part of this study, Gerbner estimated that the average American child will have watched over 8,000 murders on television before the age of 12. Consider the fact that Gerbner conducted his research in the 1970s, when the media's influence and its reach were substantially smaller, and you can imagine just how bad it must have gotten. How many murders, both real and fictional, do you think a child would have read, seen, or heard about in the media before the age of 12? 8,000 or 8 million? If that was the only problem with the media, then perhaps it won't be that horrible. After all, if bad things are happening, they need to be reported, right? Well, yes, but Gerbner said something while testifying before a US Congressional Subcommittee in 1981 that will send chills down your spine. Fearful people are more dependent, more easily manipulated and controlled, more susceptible to deceptively simple, strong, tough, and hardline measures. Could it be that the media is designed to serve people the worst news to instill fear in us so we can be more easily controlled by the powers that be? This point becomes even more plausible when you consider the fact that 90% of the media in the United States is controlled by just six corporations. This means that roughly 232 media executives are calling the shots on the vast majority of the news being presented to Americans, which is then passed on across the globe. Let's say the situation isn't as sinister as that and we aren't being subversely controlled by some criminal masterminds. At the very least, CNN, Fox, and all the other outlets want one thing. Our attention, and some of them will do anything to get it. People are more likely to pay attention to and remember negatives. Media outlets know this, which is why you'll find more negative news than positive news in your feeds. It's polarizing, engaging, and keeps us glued to our screens which in turn results in more revenue for advertisers who are literally paying for our attention. And once we start paying attention, the algorithms of social media take over and all of a sudden we're constantly being fed news that confirms our beliefs and further solidifies our already skewed worldviews. It's no secret that controversial content, the content that triggers an emotional response, is the content that performs best 
gets shared most and circulates longest. So whether we like it or not, we become bombarded with an endless scroll of polarizing content that only manages to make us even more skeptical about the world around us and suspicious of anyone who does not happen to share the same exact beliefs. This kind of reporting and these stories that we propagate throughout our society end up dividing us instead of bringing us together like the stories of old did. The sad reality is that whether the world is getting worse or not, the media will almost always make us think that it is, simply because it's good for business. Wow. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. So we've got our deadly disease. Now we just have to blame it on something that's in every household, something that people are a little bit afraid of already. The truth, which should be an unbiased representation of facts, is no longer at the core of news reporting. The story has become much more important, and stories that elicit negative emotions often get more eyeballs, reactions, and ad revenue. As a result, the problems that are constantly depicted in movies, news outlets, and on social media are relentlessly overstated to the point where we might feel it's even hopeless to do anything about them. What's worse is that this constant exposure to negative information that is relentlessly pushed on us by these obsessive algorithms can confuse the brain such that it becomes almost impossible to differentiate between exciting fact and thrilling fiction. A study conducted by three MIT scholars in 2018 found that false news spreads on Twitter substantially faster, farther, and deeper than the truth. The research also found that this misinformation wasn't spread through bots, but by actual human users, like you and I, retweeting. Just like these algorithms, our brains recognize that the most polarizing information, whether true or not, is the information that will go viral and elicit the most emotional response from the public. And so we hit share or quote in hopes of getting that viral tweet, without first verifying if the information we're spreading is accurate. Another reason why it seems like the world is substantially worse than what we see in front of us is that the news talks about things that did happen and not things that didn't. We don't hear about wars that never started due to successful peace talks or shootings that were prevented through proper policing. We barely hear when unemployment rates go down and when the economy is experiencing a turn for the better. Because again, it's just not as exciting as bad news. Sadly, as long as terrible things keep happening on the face of this planet, there will always be enough negative reports to fill the news, especially with smartphones now allowing people to become amateur reporters and crime investigators. The mean world syndrome speaks directly to our most innate fears, which then trigger our fight or flight instinct. When we watch a reporter covering a war zone, a shooting in a residential area, or a terrorist threat, our body naturally becomes flooded with hormones and chemicals designed to keep us on full alert in order to save us from the mean and bad world. While these survival characteristics were essential in our hunter-gatherer days, today all they manage to do is lead to anxiety, stress, and even trauma. But the world isn't as bad as we think it is, only the stories are. This is why to combat mean world syndrome, we have to take back control of how we're thinking, feeling, and reacting to the constant stream of negative or violent news being depicted all around us. The truth is that the world today is much better than it has ever been. Don't get me wrong, humanity is far from perfect. There are still conflicts in many places around the world, human rights issues we need to tackle, climate change problems we need to fix. But the world has never been as good as it currently is, at least for most of us. Advancements in healthcare and technology have increased our lifespans, decreased morality rates, and improved our living standards. We haven't witnessed any world wars for decades, we've grown more tolerant of each other and more accepting of our differences. Violence has steadily been on the decline since 1946, there have been fewer famine deaths in the past decade than any other time in human history, and extreme poverty has been declining literally by the second. Yes, we face harsh realities on our personal and global scale every single day, but when tragedy, crime, and war are presented as the norm and not the outliers, it's only natural for us to feel angry and afraid. We have to choose our information sources carefully, and not let the obsessive algorithms of social media dominate our perception of the world. We have to be conscious of our approach to news and entertainment and challenge the way we think. The next time you're scrolling through your feed and find a disturbing news report, ask yourself, is this fact or fiction? What real evidence is there of this occurrence? What's the context? Or am I just being manipulated so that I'll develop certain feelings of fear and suspicion? If you find your social media platform serving you the same kind of content, be conscious of this and make sure you diversify your newsfeed to include positivity to balance out the negativity. At the end of the day, we're a storytelling species and if we've learned anything from our history, it's that the narrative we share with one another is the most important thing. Just like in our hunter-gatherer days, the tales we're telling now 
will have a great influence in shaping our culture and our people. It might be time that we go back to telling stories like the wild pig and the sea cow. Maybe, if we do, we can cultivate the values that truly make us human, like caring for one another, being compassionate, and giving people the benefit of the doubt. The world is not as mean as the media wants you to believe. It's time we stopped letting them lie to us that it is. Ah, here we go again. On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland from the east, starting World War II. As you would expect, there was fear and panic throughout Europe. So, to calm the British population down and to prevent widespread panic, the War Ministry released a poster encouraging citizens to keep calm and carry on. In the year 2000, more than 60 years after the poster was released, one of the original versions was discovered, and thanks to its simple design and now satirical sounding message, it was memefied, spread all across the internet as a message of irony to keep calm and carry on, even in the face of a life-threatening situation. The Nazis are about to blow up London, keep calm and carry on. World War III is about to break out on top of dealing with Corona, keep calm and carry on. The message was simple funny, and a lighthearted way to express deep-seated concern for the situation we collectively found ourselves in. This is a meme. It has the power to express the collective emotions, feelings, and thoughts of people, and often as a coping mechanism for something that would have otherwise been rather sad. Memes. We all know them. They make us laugh, cry, think, smile, but we just can't quite explain exactly what they are. Are they just funny pictures with text? Or perhaps jokes that we turn into running gags? What exactly are memes, and how have they taken the world by storm? The word meme is a term that was originally coined by evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins in his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene. Derived from the Greek word memina, which means imitated, Dawkins described a meme as a unit of cultural information that's spread by imitation, the cultural equivalent of a gene. Tunes, catchphrases, ideas, Ways of building arches and making pots, clothes, and fashion were all described by Dawkins as memes propagating themselves in the meme pool by moving from brain to brain through a process that can loosely be described as imitation. Today, the word meme might mean something else in the dictionary, but its use still closely resembles the idea that Dawkins expressed in his work. A meme is considered good when the message in it is concise and relatable, easy to catch on and pass from person to person. When it talks about a shared experience within a group of people, when it says a lot without saying too much. Or when you just take a JPEG and throw it in a deep fryer, those are also good. Memes are so powerful because, as humans, we understand pictures more than words. Before we could write, we could draw. This is why it's no surprise that a relatable image will pass a message across much faster than, say, a long Twitter thread. Memes are so powerful because they are seemingly harmless, humorous fun. Because of this, they allow us to express our views about the world and the things that are happening around us without starting some serious debate. The year 2021 was a rather difficult year for a lot of people, not for the same reasons as 2020, but because of hope killed. In 2020, we were told that the pandemic would only last for a few weeks if we all stayed inside and social distanced. We did. And yet a year later, we were still inside. So, at the beginning of 2021, the meme, When COVID is Over, was created. In it, people describe the experience of waiting for something that might never happen, using metaphors of everyday experiences like, When COVID is Over is starting to sound like when I'm all caught up on laundry. Or pop culture references like, When COVID is Over is starting to sound like when One Direction comes back. All of which are never happening. On the surface of it, these memes are funny, relatable, and interesting expressions of the situation we're going through. But these memes carry a sense of hopelessness underneath them. And that's another thing that makes memes so powerful. They're baked with emotion. From Keanu Reeves sitting on a bench to a horse standing on the beach, memes can be used to express every form of emotion. From surprise to disappointment, excitement, skepticism, disgust, anger. Memes help us express things that we might not be able to find the right words to explain. 
They convey our expressions, desires, our deepest, darkest pains, in a lighthearted and humorous way that many have turned into a coping mechanism. A simple Google search and you'll find a meme for every bad situation you're going through. From memes that only old people use like Disaster Girl or Grumpy Cats, to stuff like whatever this is. There is always an appropriate meme that describes your feelings and whatever situation you're going through at that point. Now, I'll let you finish. on how memes are the best thing in the world since sliced bread. But first, there are some things that are not so great about memes and the way we've pretty much turned everything into a meme. Memes are fast food media. Just like fast food, they're disgustingly delicious when you take a bite. They're funny and witty and give you bite-sized information of everything that's going on around you. However, they lack any real nourishment. All you're seeing are headlines and witty remarks about what's going on, without fully understanding the depth of the issues. On the 3rd of January 2020, Qasem Soleimani, an Iranian major general, was assassinated by the United States on the order of President Donald Trump. Iran's leader, President Hassan Rouhani, made a statement afterwards saying, Iran and the other free nations of the region will take revenge for this gruesome crime from criminal America. To which Trump then replied, Iran never won a war, but never lost a negotiation. And immediately, the internet erupted with memes about World War III. For almost a week, there was an endless supply of witty remarks and bite-sized nuggets about what our lives would look like if there was another world war. Here we are in February 2022, and yet again, the World War III memes are returning. However, a lot of people who joined in the memes did not understand why they were being created in the first place, and what purpose they served. People looked at those memes and felt that they knew enough about the issue, without bothering to find out what had just happened and the true repercussions of the actions of the US government, if any. They binged on the fast food without taking the time to eat a proper meal in the form of a full news article on the subject, which, even then, are rarely full of all the true information. Memes can also be a tool of misinformation. It's easiest to tell a person a lie when they're feeling good and vulnerable, which is why it's so easy to propagate lies and misinformation through memes. Memes are more powerful than we give them credit for. Laugh through one, two, three memes on a subject, and before you know it, you've unconsciously accepted some of the ideas that the memes present. Netflix and chill first started out as a meme, but today it's a cultural phenomenon that describes, unironically, something completely different than it did before the meme existed. This is one of the many times when a meme transcends the internet and becomes a truly cultural phenomenon. Netflix and chill is, well, chill. But there are some other memes that have become stereotypical tools used offensively to describe an activity or a person, but aren't seen as negative as regular stereotypes because they're memes. Take the Nigerian Prince meme, for example. It labels an entire country as a bunch of fraudsters. If the memes have taught us anything, it's that labels like this can completely transform how people view and relate with the people of a particular nationality. When Trump called it the Chinese virus, people of East Asian descent began getting attacked for something they really knew nothing about. Chinese restaurants all over the country were affected, with many having to close down. Even the beer Corona was abandoned on shelves for a long time at the beginning of the pandemic just because of its name. So we see and understand the dangers of a single story, but yet with the Nigerian prince, we let it slide because it's a funny meme. It looks relatively harmless, but yet there are millions of people who will never work with Nigerians because they believe they're inherently fraudsters. The truth is that memes, just like every other joke, are embedded in cultural context. It's derived by our views and thoughts about the world, some of which might be problematic. However, unlike with a joke that's tied to the comedian, memes spread so quickly and have such a far-reaching impact that it's often difficult to know who to hold accountable, or whether it's possible to even do so in the first place. The YouTube channel BuzzFeed has an entire section of videos of people who have accidentally become memes, and while many of the people in these videos claim to be happy with their memification, there are many other people out there whose pictures have been turned into memes that they're not happy about. But sadly, there's nothing they can do about it. Memes often capture you when you're least flattering, whether it's Keanu Reeves sitting on a bench sad, or the kindergarten boy who couldn't get his words together, 
or the thousands of people whose pictures or videos of emotional breakdowns have been turned into memes. How would you feel if your least flattering picture was turned into a meme, immortalized forever on the internet? It's a sad reality that if the internet deems your photo meme-worthy, you have no say on how far the picture travels and whether or not it ever stops traveling. Think about people with body dysmorphia issues, fear of judgment, and a lack of self-esteem. Think about the pictures we'll never see and the emotions that will never be expressed, for the fear of being turned into a meme. If you don't agree with anything I've said so far, a simple meme like ratioed or OK Boomer can be used to end the argument, which I guess is good for damage control, but is yet another problem with memes. In a bid to be the funniest person in the discussion, we often don't listen to the other party, and instead just try to get the last laugh. Once someone says something we don't agree with, or we don't feel like arguing, we quickly hit them with a meme and just move on without acknowledging their point or even trying to understand it. So we don't learn anything new, and we just keep holding on to our ideas and beliefs, at least until another meme rolls around that we can use to start or end another argument. The truth is, memes are both good and bad, and understanding the two sides of the coin is important in making progress. There have been some incredible achievements and great examples of community building through memes. This is just one of the many beautiful things that memes have given us. In 2010, a Japanese kindergarten teacher uploaded a picture of her two-year-old Shiba Inu with a peculiarly round, emotionless face. Twelve years later, and that one picture has given us many memes, created an entirely new genre of entertainment with pets speaking broken English, and even created two cryptocurrencies, Dogecoin and Shiba Inu, that at their peak, were combined both worth a total of nearly $100 billion. A hundred billion dollars, all from a meme. When you sit back and really look at it, the power of a single meme is so incredible and far-reaching. It has the ability to make you feel part of a collective, yet still uniquely individual. But uh, I, I'm a head out. The meme stock trading trend with its Wall Street bets form reaching a $10 billion valuation in its latest funding round, the company says it has already raised more than $400 million from Fidelity and plans to raise up to $700 million in total. In 2021, Reddit was at its peak, valued at around $10 billion. Today, just two years later, its valuation has dropped to around $5.5 billion. How did a Silicon Valley unicorn slice its value in half in just two years? This is the story of the dramatic rise and fall of Reddit. Often called the front page of the internet, Reddit is one of the most visited websites and consists solely of user-generated content. The site is made up of over 138,000 communities called subreddits that are dedicated to all sorts of topics. Users of the platform called Redditors use these communities to post ideas, ask opinions, and share common interests. Have you ever been in a group of people and brought up what you think is the most exciting thing you've ever heard, only to be met with blank stares? What you might consider incredibly fascinating they couldn't care less about. I'm sure most of us have had this happen to us multiple times. It can be hard to find people we have things in common with. Even our best friends and family will find certain topics we love strange or boring. And that's the beauty of Reddit. No matter how niche, weird, or dull the topic, there's an active community of people having endless discussions about it. At its best, the site emulates casual conversation between friends, which makes sense because it was founded by two friends. University of Virginia roommates Steve Huffman and Alexis Ohanian founded Reddit in 2005, and like many successful entrepreneurs, the idea came after the failure of a previous company. Huffman and Ohanian launched a startup called My Mobile Menu, allowing users to order food via text. This was long before the days of Grubhub and Postmates. Speaking of food deliveries, finding the time to cook is getting increasingly difficult. Add that to the rising cost of groceries, and it's easy to see why a lot of people resort to food delivery services for their daily nutrition. The problem is that most of these services are expensive and unhealthy, which is why I recommend our sponsor for today's episode, Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit that delivers nutritious meals straight to your door. With Factor, you can skip growing grocery shopping and cooking, but still get the benefits of both with meals that are affordable and healthy. The meals are freshly made using high-quality ingredients, and there's also a wide variety of options to choose from with over 34 weekly restaurant-quality meals like bruschetta shrimp risotto, Green Goddess Chicken and Grilled Steakhouse Filet Mignon, as well as Vegan Keto Protein Plus and Calorie Smart options to fit your lifestyle and nutritional needs. 
The best part about this is that all factor meals can be prepared in just two minutes, and all of this is sustainable. The company offsets 100% of its delivery emissions and uses 100% renewable energy for its production sites and offices. To enjoy fresh flavor packed meals delivered to your door, head to factormeals.com slash aperture50 and use code aperture50 to get 50% off. Again, that's code aperture50 at factormeals.com slash aperture50 to get 50% off. After my mobile menu failed, they applied the same concept of direct communication to a new idea, one that eventually became Reddit. In just 2006, one year after its launch, Reddit was acquired by Condé Nast, one of the largest media companies in the world. Reddit's rise to being the front page of the internet was electric. People who wanted that wide variety of discussions and commentary quickly found a home on Reddit. It became a hub for memes, viral videos, and political activism. Influential bloggers and programmers began using the site to share interesting nuggets and ideas, and soon Reddit became the go-to site for tech-related news. In 2009, Reddit developed its first on-site advertising strategy to generate revenue. The promise of anonymity on the site has always attracted an incredibly diverse community, bringing in a diverse set of advertisers. Since anyone can find something interesting on Reddit, most companies can find a reason to advertise on it. Reddit has always had a unique approach to marketing for brands. Ad options include the sponsor posts, targeted displays, or video ads. Brands can also create their own subreddits for advertising and marketing. If Wonder Bread wanted to talk about how amazing sliced white bread is, they could start a subreddit for bread aficionados, and there probably already is one. Reddit's strategy paid off. In 2014, the company raised $50 million on a $500 million valuation. Over the years and several more rounds of funding, Reddit eventually reached that $10 billion valuation in 2021. It was, as they say in Silicon Valley, a unicorn. Rare to find, but precious to behold. But as Reddit grew its users and advertising revenue, its problems grew as well. One of the first controversies the site was involved in came on the heels of the 2013 Boston Marathon bombings. Users created a subreddit to find the Boston bombers. The moderators of the subreddit, unpaid users to enforce the community's rules, tried to ensure that no one's personal information was posted, but things quickly spiraled out of control. Users wrongly identified suspects in the bombing and never correctly named the people who turned out to be responsible. Notably, they spread the information about a college student named Sunil Tripathi, who went missing right before the bombings. After the actual bombers were arrested, Sunil's body was found in the Providence River, having died by suicide. Not only did Sunil's family have to bear the harassment of their missing son from these Redditors, but both BuzzFeed and NBC News reporters spread unsourced information from the subreddit, giving it legitimate journalistic credibility. Reddit's controversies didn't end there. The platforms always had sexually explicit material, but things went way too far in 2014 when naked photos of celebrities began circulating on different subreddits. And even worse, some of those celebrities were underage at the time. In Reddit's defense, it swooped into action swiftly, identified the photos of minors, and removed them from the platform. Then, a year later, the site banned nude images posted without the subject's consent. This move was a win for everyone. It stopped non-consensual explicit material from being easily accessible on the platform, but allowed adult performers freedom of expression. Not safe for work or NSFW content as it's now tagged on the platform wasn't the only thing Reddit had to stop spreading through its communities. Today, Sony canceled the Christmas Day release of the interview. The hackers win. I don't know how else to frame it now that Sony has canceled the release of the interview that spoof about North Korea starring James Franco and Seth Rogen. In 2014, Redditors shared hacked files from Sony Pictures that included copyrighted material. Leaked documents from the Mormon Church have also been shared. Although the company prides itself on anonymity and free speech in situations like these, it's had to step in and exert control over some subreddits. In 2015, Reddit CEO Steve Hoffman made a policy banning several offensive and sexual communities. This included subreddits like Lollicon, which posted sexually explicit animated material featuring children. More bans followed. A subreddit that expressed support for the shooter in the 2015 Charleston Church mass shooting was removed. During the 2016 election, a subreddit that pushed the Pizzagate conspiracy theory that Democratic leaders were running a child sex ring was also banned. As American politics grew more divisive, more bans took place. In response to user demand after the protests over George Floyd's murder in 2020, Reddit updated its content policies and introduced rules around hate speech. 
It then banned around 2,000 subreddits across the political spectrum in violation of these regulations. Some media outlets and political commentators said banning these subreddits violated the freedom of political expression. Then in 2021, a subreddit called Donald Trump was banned for policy violations and the influence its posts had on those who stormed the Capitol. Moves like this followed on Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok, but were criticized by those who believed it was censorship. It hasn't been all negative for Reddit these past few years. In 2021, Redditors proved how powerful online communities can be with the infamous GameStop short squeeze. Users in a subreddit agreed to buy stock in The Suffering Company. When they started, shares were selling for $3, and as the price increased because of the Reddit users purchasing the stock, Wall Street traders shorted it, betting it would drop until the company went out of business. But Reddit users shouldn't be underestimated. Within 16 days, they drove the stock up to $347.51, and many of those Wall Street short sellers lost a whole bunch of cash. Six billion to be exact. This highlighted the power of the Reddit community. Redditors aren't afraid to wield this power when they feel it's necessary, even against the platform they call home. Over the years, a battle between Reddit, the company, and its users has been brewing, and recently it hit a flashpoint. Some of the most critical users on Reddit are the subreddit moderators. These volunteers manage the communities, set and enforce specific rules, and remove posts and comments that violate those rules, and collectively, Reddit moderators do a total of 466 hours of work daily. That's $3.4 million in unpaid labor every year, and that accounts for nearly 3% of the company's annual revenue. Basically, Reddit needs this unpaid labor to survive, so when the moderators fight back on a decision, the company usually listens, but not this time, at least not yet. Reddit announced in April 2023 that it would start charging developers for its API access. In the simplest of terms, an API or application programming interface is software that allows two different applications to talk to each other. It's what allows you to log on to different websites using your Apple or Google account. The API allows Google to talk directly to the website and share your personal information with them, so you don't have to create new usernames and input all your information for every single account you use. Some companies allow developers to access their API for free, while others charge for it. Reddit switched from the former to the latter. Reddit's API launched seven years ago and has always been free. Anyone building an app could request data from Reddit and use that data to develop their app. But since July 1st, 2023, developers have had to pay to use Reddit's API. The affected developers and many Reddit moderators haven't been pleased. In June of 2023, moderators organized a damaging blackout to protest this policy change. The 48-hour blackout, called Red Dark, included 8,500 subreddits that were set to private, meaning no visiting, no posting, no commenting. Six of the most popular subreddits participated, including Gaming, Food, and Funny, which have over 30 million subscribers each. In total, Red Dark accounted for over 2.5 billion users. And it's happened before. On July 2nd, 2015, a group of moderators participated in a Reddit blackout and temporarily shut down their subreddits. They were protesting the firing of Reddit employee Victoria Taylor, an administrator who helped organize famous Ask Me Anything interviews. This act, known as AMA Geddon, highlighted Reddit moderators' power. But the more recent blackout in protest of Reddit's decision to start charging third-party developers for access to the site's data is even worse. CEO Steve Hoffman said that charging for API access was meant to keep artificial intelligence from learning Reddit's data for free. But is it really Reddit's data if all the content on the platform is user-generated? There's no definitive answer, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Although Reddit has said that tiny apps with less than 100 requests per minute will still be able to use the free API and that other exceptions, like accessibility-focused apps, will not have to pay. Unfortunately, it's not just big AI companies like OpenAI and Google that are suffering. Apollo was a popular app that enhanced the Reddit browsing experience for iOS users, and because of its popularity, it made over 7 billion data requests a month through Reddit's API. Under the new rules, Apollo would have to pay $20 million a year to use the Reddit API, an impossible number for its developer Christian Seliff to pay. As a result, Apollo went dark. The blackout was supposed to end on June 14th, but almost half of the subreddits involved have stayed down indefinitely. Even the moderators who are reopening are making a joke of it to prove a point. The Steam subreddit, originally created for the Steam gaming platform, is now all about Steam engines. The Pix subreddit is comprised solely of photos of comedian and HBO host John Oliver. Some moderators are marking their subreddit NSFW as not safe for work because Reddit can't run ads on NSFW content. 
while moderators of the famous AMA subreddit say they won't coordinate any more celebrity interviews. But some communities are taking the protests to the extreme and leaving the site entirely for platforms like Kabin and Lemmy. Could this be the end of Reddit as we know it? The blackout has received a ton of media attention and at one point, Reddit crashed because it couldn't handle so many subreddits going dark at once. Despite the damage, Reddit refuses to change its course on its API policy. Users have claimed that the company is forcing moderators out of their subreddit, which Reddit corporate denies. Reddit announced the API policy change because its current model wasn't sustainable, and it claims it wants to be fairly paid for API access since it costs Reddit money to provide API services. The problem is that this is happening with little to no warning, sending moderators into their collective rampage against the company. Also, in the words of tech creator MKBHD, the number one rule on the internet that's never been successfully broken is to charge for something that was previously free. And it's not just Reddit. Elon Musk has started charging a subscription fee for the verification badge on Twitter, and he also charges for API access, which shut down dozens of third-party apps. Meta 2 has introduced a paid verification plan, a monthly fee for a better customer service, increased visibility, and the coveted blue checkmark. But aren't they successfully breaking that rule? Because all of these companies still have billions of users, and sure, a small vocal selection will leave, but most people just return to the platforms after a few days or weeks as if nothing happened. Whether it's Reddit, Twitter, or even the new threads from Meta, we're quick to return to something comfortable even if we don't particularly like it, especially when there's no viable alternative. So is this the fall of Reddit? Well, I doubt it. But who knows, it might be the start of something else. Because while it may be idealistic to think that we, as everyday people, have the power to change things, maybe that's the idealism we need. After almost two years of this mess, I decided I needed a break and wanted to do some traveling. I booked all the tickets, got the paperwork done, and was all set to go. And then, I noticed, on the corner of the screen, the plane I was about to fly not once, but twice, was the 737 MAX 8. I'm no aviation expert, but I do read the news from time to time, and I think the MAX 8 crashed. Twice. The route I was flying had no alternatives, and so I kinda had to fly that plane. Of course, I made it to the other side, and here I am talking to you. But up until the moment the plane came to a halt on the tarmac for the second and final time, my heart rate was elevated and all I could think of was whether I would become the next headline on the news websites for all the wrong reasons. It didn't matter to me that the MAX-8 was only cleared to fly after thorough revisions and independent authorizations from the United States, European Union, and each airline that subsequently chose to fly it all of which are institutions we would have trusted if we got on another plane. It didn't matter that after being grounded for nearly two years, the plane had actually been in the sky for nearly a year before I boarded one. It also didn't occur to me that after landing, to go to the hotel, I casually got onto a taxi, an act that is nearly 100 times more likely to result in my death. This is just one of the ways in which the things we believe completely violate the rules of rational, scientific ways of thinking. You and I hold many such beliefs. We all know this to some extent, and yet when someone sitting across the table displays this very tendency for just the right topics, we can't help but be enraged about how clearly we see the facts, and they don't. Whether it be vaccination, climate change, gun ownership, or any of the heavily debated topics of today, we have all experienced being on one side of the debate or the other, where we desperately try changing someone else's opinion. Almost always, regardless of the nature of the debate, neither party changes their stance. In fact, most people feel a defensive need to double down and be even firmer about the position they already held. The result of all of this is ever-increasing polarization of the overall social and political climate. Take climate change, for example. One could theorize that the more educated a person is, the more likely they are to believe climate change is happening, and humans are largely responsible for it. Here, educated refers to institutional education, so people that have bachelors and masters should, in theory, find climate change a no-brainer. But studies do not reflect that. 
Level of education is, in fact, a very poor predictor of whether or not you believe in climate change or any other issue, really. What is a better predictor is how you politically identify, unfortunately. As a matter of fact, generally more educated people tend to have even more polarized views on this issue and others than less educated people. Contrary to what you and I may think, people that don't believe in climate change don't necessarily do so because they're stupid. Far from it. The refusal to believe scientific evidence relies on how bias-driven the human thought process is. Once an initial bias has been developed, it is extremely difficult to change our minds. This has been demonstrated by numerous experiments where scientists presented participants with a made-up study about climate change. Neither party was aware whether the study was made up or not. The participants who already believed in climate change used it as reinforcement of their beliefs, and those that did not simply dismissed the study as bogus. Fake studies that argue against climate change have the same effect. People who already believe in climate change dismiss it with ease, and those who don't, embrace it. Presented with a new fact, both groups essentially become more polarized than they initially were. The more you feed into it, the worse it gets. Another experiment conducted in 2005 revealed what is known as choice blindness. Participants were shown two photos, one of which they had to pick as the more attractive one. They were then asked to argue what about the photo led them to their decision. After their choices, the researchers went on to secretly switch the photo with the option they had not chosen. Some participants recognized the switch, of course. But most did not, and they remarkably went ahead and actually justified the choice they didn't even make. This just goes to show that once the initial choice was made through gut feeling, emotion, or some other impulse, all the participants really cared about was convincing themselves that they had made the most rational decision. It reiterates that our positions often have very little to do with evidence. Then what do they have to do with? And why do we end up defending them? Well, it has to do with our evolutionary desire to belong. Straying away from the herd does not do your chances of survival in the wild any good. Sure, you want to discover which new fruit you can eat or what new place you can find food in. But this curiosity must not overwhelm the need for survival. And even if we don't run the risk of being eaten in modern times, that tendency has very much remained in place. While curiosity in the search for truth often excites us, the need to belong to whatever group we find ourselves in seems to overwhelm all else. Today, when you see relatives arguing about politics over Thanksgiving dinner, what they are really doing is just signaling to everyone else what group or political ideology they belong to and how proud they are about it. Another reason why people tend to defend these, often ill-informed opinions, is because of how much they think they know about these topics. Known as illusion of explanatory depth, it's a mistake we are all guilty of having made. It's so easy to start a discussion with a friend and veer off into some deep uncharted territory but carry on and make up things as you go along as so not to seem uninformed. Despite better access to information, it's especially prevalent in today's age where tweets are cheap, but thoughts are not. In an interesting 2014 experiment to illustrate this tendency, participants were asked about their recommendations about military intervention by the United States in Crimea. They were also asked to point out Ukraine on a map. The median guess as to where Ukraine was was off by nearly 1800 miles, and the farther off a participant was, the more likely they were to recommend military intervention. The researchers, Sloman and Fernbach, essentially summed up this result by the following quote, As a rule, strong feelings about issues do not emerge from deep understanding. These examples should make it clear that the conspiracy theorists that people love to bash on may actually not be that far ideologically from the rest of us as we may think. Their reflexive need to belong is just as strong, if not stronger, than the rest of us. The only difference, perhaps, is the initial set of assumptions. In fact, conspiracy theories are often initiated on factual grounds. It's only later that they tend to diverge into unrealistic and unfounded realms. Case in point, a few months ago, there were reports of people licking handrails and doorbells because they thought it would strengthen their immune system. Before I say anything else, I just want to say, please don't lick handrails or doorbells. Now, the idea that these people have in mind is that your body reacts to some stress by building itself back better and stronger. 
This is a totally scientifically sound idea, and it's called hormesis. In fact, a hormetic response takes place in your body every time you eat broccoli. Where these people are wrong, however, is that hormesis doesn't just respond to any stress. It has to be very mild. While exposure to germs in small doses does induce a hormetic response, the surface of a doorbell has far too much bacteria to be even remotely safe. For reference, the surface of a mobile phone is more contaminated than that of a toilet seat, and your phone is only used by you. Imagine a surface that is touched all day, every day, by multiple people. Then there are caveats to how information is created in our world that doesn't lend itself to confidence for everyone. For example, the scientific method often relies on the idea of uncertainty, and that is something human beings are not confident with. All uncertainties are not equal, of course, but even the slightest shred of doubt is sufficient in convincing critics of a piece of evidence why they were right all along. Why pay attention to these unsure scientists when you can just listen to confident Uncle Tom? This is, unfortunately, an aspect that was taken advantage of by the lobbyists of smoking companies when the public wasn't sure about its harms, and now by people that don't believe climate change is either happening or being caused by humans. Anything less than total, absolute consensus in their minds is just not insufficient, but incriminating evidence that they have been lied to this whole time. But insistence on the need to have uncertainty is perhaps the greatest gift from the scientific method. After all, it quantifies, as best we can, how far we are from the actual truth, and what we might need to get there. So how do we try and change someone's mind when we think they are wrong? Well, we can first start by assessing our proposition. We should only propose changes that are relatively minor in comparison to the position the person already holds. It can help to think of ideological scales. For example, on a scale of 1 to 10, if a person believes an idea that is a 7, and our ultimate goal is to convince the person of a position that is a 2, we are better off by proposing a 5 first. Of course, over time we can expose them to other ideas, but we ought to start gently. This is because a drastic ideological shift is not very realistic, and is more likely to encourage polarization. Before you tell them that they're wrong, tell them they're right. People usually come at an argument from a certain angle. If we are able to recognize that angle instead of arbitrarily laying out facts, and we allow others to discover, as opposed to being embarrassed by our argument from their own point of view, we stand a better chance of changing their minds. Another method to have a fruitful and informative discussion is to have an aggressive moderator. Now of course having a moderator in any kind of unofficial debate is not very routine, but it might as well keep your family together. Hear me out. Generally, the antagonism between two debaters who are arguing on a hot topic is because they feel as though they belong to different groups, as we've said earlier. Now, if you introduce a moderator, and an aggressive one at that, the focus quickly shifts from needing to defend each other from themselves to defending each other from the moderator. This can have a unifying effect that forces the debaters to see more reason in their opponent's arguments. Another mistake people make when arguing for or against a government position is to forget that the person who is arguing is not the government, or even a representative of it. If, say, you are debating the policies of Brazilian foreign policy with a citizen of Brazil, chances are the person you are talking to had no hand in formulating the policy, whether or not they voted for the government that did also likely is that they actually know very little about the policy and are defending it for the same old reason, to feel like they belong. In this instance, it is far too easy to attribute bad faith to the person in front of you, but it is important to remind yourself that they are probably as clueless as you are, and, in reality, you're arguing for no point. As much as we would like to believe, facts don't change minds. We have more access to information than ever before, and yet we were also more polarized than ever. In this seemingly irreparable climate, it's important to recognize why people believe the things they do, and how we are never too far from having believed them too. We can always be kinder in our effort to understand the people across the table. Only then do we stand a chance to bridge our ideological gaps. After all, facts don't change minds. People do.
Have you ever donated money to a charity or taken your clothes to the Goodwill store? How did it make you feel? Amazing, right? Most of us at some point in our lives have either donated or will donate money, clothes, food, shelter, and our time to others. And we do these things not because there's an immediate reward for it. More often than not, we feel best when we give to people who cannot reciprocate, or at least not in the same capacity. This altruistic feeling that makes us give to one another even when there's nothing to receive was described by ancient Greeks as philanthropia, the love of humanity. Coined around 2,500 years ago, this term was first used in the myth of Prometheus. In the story, the titan god Prometheus saved humanity from Zeus's destruction and earned the title of Philanthropos, Tropos, or humanity-loving character. Although that's the term we now mostly use to describe this phenomenon, the love for humanity isn't an exclusively Greek concept. The idea of benevolence towards one another has its roots deeply planted in ancient civilizations throughout the world, from the Middle East to Egypt to the city of Rome. It was also propagated by Babylonian communities as early as the third millennium, and is at the core of all Abrahamic religions and many others across the world. In Egyptian sacred writings such as the Book of the Dead, it was made clear to the people of the ancient world that a successful passage into the afterlife depended on a lifetime record of benevolent acts towards people who were suffering. While many of us today do not follow any of these ancient teachings or believe in an afterlife anymore, the messages they taught have stayed with us through millennia. So, when capitalism and accumulation of wealth began rising in the West in the 1700s, it wasn't surprising to start seeing rich philanthropists pop up whose lives became characterized by the voluntary act of giving a large sum of their wealth to promote the common good. This type of lavish giving, the one we most associate with philanthropy today, was rather popularized by rich bankers such as George Peabody, who is now considered the father of modern philanthropy. Peabody was an American merchant banker who came from poverty. After amassing his fortune in the early 19th century, he never forgot his humble beginnings and dedicated the later years of his life to charitable work. It's believed that he gave away around 8 million of his 16 million fortune to charities, his incredible benevolence paved the way for later generations of rich philanthropists. Sadly, what we have today isn't what Peabody envisioned when he gave away half of his net worth. What started with the notion of lending a helping hand, charitable work is no longer at the core of philanthropy in today's world. Tax evasion and personal gains have tainted the hands of the world's wealthiest givers and have caused a huge wealth gap that only seems to be growing, creating an ever-expanding rift between the social classes. How did we turn that amazing feeling you get giving money away to charity into a corrupt scheme for billionaires and large corporations? To understand this, we have to go back to the end of the 19th century. Andrew Carnegie, an American industrialist, paved the trail for philanthropic work to be used as a tax evasion strategy. Carnegie opposed federal income taxes and argued that he was better off allocating those funds to charities rather than the government. At that time, Philanthropy by the ultra-rich funded social services the government couldn't afford. As a result, senators worried that taxing the wealthy on these charitable amounts would reduce their contributions and increase the burden on the government, a logic that still prevails to this day. The government's solution to this problem was a tax exemption on income for money donated to charity. This legislative move allowed for new wealth management strategies, pioneered by Carnegie who founded a charitable trust that took advantage of the tax exemptions. Before long, Wealthy industrialists and bankers started following in Carnegie's footsteps, protecting their fortunes from substantial taxes under the cover of charitable trusts. In 2014, Nicholas Woodman, the founder and CEO of GoPro, took his company public and was suddenly worth $3 billion. To celebrate his newly acquired fortune, Woodman announced that he would be donating a whopping $500 million worth of GoPro stock to a foundation bearing his name. The truth is not as generous as Woodman would want you to believe. You see, the GoPro CEO took advantage of a loophole that would allow him to donate his money without actually donating it. This is done through something called a donor-advised fund. Donor-advised funds are essentially charitable investment accounts in which owners can claim tax deductions up front without legally being required to distribute the money to charities right away. As long as the money is transferred into these funds under the rules of charitable work, owners can avoid paying higher taxes without donating any of it to charities or foundations. The point of these funds was originally to encourage more resources to get to communities where they're most needed. Sadly, 
The way the laws are structured allows tax deductions without any requirement for that money to ever reach those intended communities. It's no surprise then, since 2007, the number of DAFs in the US has tripled. And while the amount of money donated every year keeps increasing, the actual amount going to communities barely is. From the $466 billion in the United States in 2020, only around $35 billion made its way to qualified charities. A huge sum of money, yes, but not nearly as much as the rich would want you to believe that they give away. The reality is that these billionaires are entitled to spend their money however they wish. We can argue the ethics of becoming a billionaire another day, but let's say they got there on their own merit. They aren't required to give anything. The main problem isn't that they don't give, but that they claim to give more than they actually do. It's the need to be seen as a hero without doing anything heroic. Last year, Elon Musk announced that he would be donating $5.7 billion worth of Tesla shares to an undisclosed charity. However, to this day, no single charity has reported receiving the funds from Musk's donation, with many experts hypothesizing that he suddenly dumped the cash in a DAF. Financially speaking, offloading $5.7 billion worth of Tesla stock allowed him to claim a tax deduction of 30% on his income. That's about $570 million saved on taxes. So it seems that the only beneficiary from Musk's charity is Musk himself. First on the tax deductions, and second on the public praise he received because he theoretically donated so much money. Just months before that, Elon tweeted that he would donate $6 billion to end world hunger if the UN could show him a plan on how they would spend the money. The UN responded by saying that $6 billion won't solve world hunger, but could potentially save 42 million people on the brink of starvation. From pooled income funds to private foundations to DAFs, philanthropy today is only magnifying the issue of income inequality and adding to the already substantial gap in wealth. But that's not even all. The word philanthropy does not only mean giving to charities anymore. Now, it is also used to describe giving to groups that promote social or civic causes. And these groups can keep their donors completely anonymous, which basically gives billionaires the power to weaponize their philanthropy for political gain. In her book Dark Money, Jane Mayer documents how the uber-rich have used their charitable foundations to invest in ideology like venture capitalists, leveraging their fortunes for maximum strategic impact. Mayer argues that these foundations only support causes that benefit their financiers by campaigning against regulations and sowing misinformation in the heart of the masses. The Odlin Foundation, for example, led numerous anti-environmentalism campaigns. The Bradley Foundation, funded by $1.6 billion, waged aggressive campaigns against teachers' unions and traditional public schools. Since the donations to these foundations are tax-deductible, donors aren't accountable for the public use of their money, which only adds to their power and influence. And because these donations can be completely anonymous, it also rids the billionaires of any iota of responsibility for their actions. The sad reality of our society is that this isn't something new. Rich people have always depended on favorable political conditions to build and preserve their wealth. Mega philanthropists know that their money can influence governments far more than they'd ever be able to, even if they were to run for office themselves. This is why when Bill Gates was asked whether he'd run for president, he said, I could have as much impact in my role as a philanthropist as I could in any political role. I don't have to raise political campaigns, I don't have to try to get elected. I'm not term limited to 8 years. To be fair, Bill Gates and his foundation have dedicated immense amounts of money to battle health crises such as malaria and the reduction of child morality. While most of his work remains true to the original definition of the word, the love of humanity, there are still some shady things he's done in the past. A few years ago, Gates was able to heavily influence the passing of a bill for charter schools despite voters voting against it three different times. After millions of dollars spent on campaigns that influenced the community into changing their decision, the bill passed the fourth time. Almost immediately, Gates began subsidizing charter schools until the Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional. But would that bill stop Gates? No. He simply used his influence with lawmakers to fund a new bill to allow him to circumvent the Supreme Court's decision so he could keep funding these charter schools. This is a great example of how wealth can influence public policy. Plutocracy, or placing the power of society in the hands of the wealthy, can undermine our laws and leave us vulnerable to the whims of the rich. Whether they have good intentions or not, the lives of the populace should not be in the hands of a few, no matter how wealthy they are. 
We should all have a say in matters concerning our lives, regardless of our socioeconomic impact. The Giving Pledge, which was launched by Gates and Warren Buffett in 2010, has more than 200 ultra-rich signatories who have pledged to donate at least half of their wealth towards the betterment of humankind. This is an excellent achievement and one that must be praised. Giving such large amounts of money can never be easy, and so the effort must be acknowledged. At the same time, we must also look on the other side of the coin and the power that these billionaires ever so greedily hoard in the process. In his book Winner Takes All, Anand Girdadas argues that rich people who have lobbied for an economy of injustice have at the same time marketed themselves as our saviors and the solution to all of our problems. However, in doing so, they subtly hide the fact that they cause most of these problems themselves. CEO of Wayne Enterprises by day, hero of Gotham by night. The sinister truth is this. As long as there are so few people with so much money and power, the rest of us will have no say. We need to go back to the original meaning of philanthropy, where the love of humanity was the only driving force, not money, power, or control. We need to close the loopholes in the system that give people an advantage by donating money without having to donate anything at all. Until then, we'll have to settle for the supposed heroes with the agendas to come and save us from the very problems they brought upon us. In 1951, students at Swarthmore College were the subject of a curious experiment. Solomon Ash designed the experiment in which a few students would have to complete a seemingly easy task. Students would be shown a card with a line drawn on it. Then they would be shown another card, this time with three lines, all of different lengths. The task was to simply pick the line that matched the length with the one that they were shown earlier. The cards themselves always had lines that were longer or shorter than the correct line including, of course, the correct line itself, and the instructions on how to respond were clearly laid out. However, the interesting thing was that only one of the eight or so participants in each trial was the actual subject of the study. Everyone else was in on the study, and was simply an actor meant to sway the participant to choose the wrong line. Even though they knew 100% which was the correct answer, they purposely chose the wrong answer numerous times to try and get the subject to do the same. Upon completion of multiple trials with a variety of constraints and a similar setup, it was seen that in the control group, where there was no persuasion towards an incorrect answer, participants chose the wrong lines less than 1% of the time, which is what you would expect. It's a rather simple experiment. When participants were put in a group where their peers chose the wrong answer, despite clear evidence suggesting otherwise, a remarkable 36.8% of them conformed and chose the wrong answer as well. These are students of a very well-ranked college, mind you, who are certainly cognitively capable enough to distinguish between lines of different links. Referring to how clear the differences should have been, Ash himself interpreted the results by saying, The fact that intelligent, well-meaning, young people are willing to call white black is a matter of concern. It just goes to show one of the many ways in which our peers can influence the decisions we make. It also puts forward an almost desperate desire in us humans to conform, one which I am sure you felt at one time or another. Why do I bring this up? Well, I do sort of talk about a social issue. An issue that is suffering from a lack of reason, empathy, and measured judgment. I'm talking about cancel culture. It's essentially getting expelled from society, in which a person deemed to have committed a social crime, past or present, is dealt with punishment in the form of terminated employment, public humiliation, or a complete boycott altogether. There's a disagreement about when the phenomenon was actually created with some saying it has been with us in different forms for centuries. But what makes cancel culture unique, in a sense, to our time, is the fact that its effect is now much larger than just a crowd or a locality. It's the entire social media audience. Any news spreads rather quickly on social media, but bad news spreads really quickly, especially when it's about the career-ending tweet of a very famous author, actor, scientist, or what have you. People from pretty much all fields have been forced to embrace cancelhood to some extent. And so, it's fair to say that it is no longer a punishment only for the elites. Take Amelie Wenzel's story, for example. She's a young adult fiction author who was about to debut a three-book trilogy in 2019. That was until readers of a small private online group discovered that the fictional characters in her fiction novel offended their notion of race relations in the real world. And on came a slew of furious tweets accusing her of being blind to reality, lacking education, as well as many other far worse things. Zhao subsequently posted an apology, as often happens to be the case, and said that she, out of embarrassment, 
had asked the publisher not to publish her books at the time. What about her initial book was so offensive, you and I will never really know. But why not let the book be released as it was, and let it play out in the wider marketplace of ideas? The book was eventually corrected, whatever that means, and then released. No harm done, right? Well, let's take a step back. Zhao, who had immigrated to the United States from China, was simply drawing on her perspective on indentured labor and human trafficking, albeit in a fictional setting. Hers certainly had the potential to be a valuable insight into these things, considering they happened in her home country. A Twitter mob had almost rid a female immigrant author of her chance to share her experience. You see, the second version, which she eventually published, was not edited from a creative passion. It was done so out of fear. The fear of being doxxed. The fear of being badmouthed by people who knew nothing about her. The fear of having her career stifled before it even took off. The fear of being cancelled. Well, you could argue that Zhao was never truly cancelled. Her predicament is a prime example of what happens on a daily basis to people who feel pressured not to speak their minds on certain issues. The creative field is perhaps just as impacted as the political one, with TV shows getting cancelled or amended on a regular basis these days, books being pulled from shelves, and even so much more. Think of the famous TV shows of our time. Think about your favorite shows. Revisit them, and consider for one moment how many of them could have been made and released in today's time. Creative decisions are no longer allowed to be as risky, which, as you can imagine, doesn't really help the creative process. The end result is often a product that is dry and one that is compelled to nudge the viewer towards a moral side of its choosing. Conveniently moral or morally convenient? You tell me. There are other forms of cancellation too. For example, the ones where the mob dislikes a particular celebrity or show and goes on to reach out to any and all affiliated companies to try and cancel their affiliation. Otherwise, they risk being cancelled themselves. Studies have shown that these boycotts do have economic significance, with as much as one in four of them forcing significant changes. And while that may seem like an example of power that customers hold in a free market setting, which it is, let's think about it for a second. If you dislike the CEO of a company for a political position of theirs, despite you liking the quality of product that the company produces, does a boycott really hit the CEO's pocket as much as it hits the pocket of the employees who are living paycheck to paycheck below them? More so, does it improve the product? Who is the practical target of your outrage? Cancel culture is often referred to as a guilty unless proven innocent process, in which the victim is really only let off the hook when there's an overwhelming support of evidence in his or her side. But is that really the case? Forgetting celebrities and big corporations, a much larger victim of this online shaming is the average person. The reason is, these average people have neither the social credit nor the financial capital to come back from a cancellation. These people often find it exceptionally difficult to revive their careers, because no employer wants to take on the liability of a cancelled person and face the music of the mob. It's essentially a justice system, where no amount of punishment is enough. There is no scale nor proportion. There is no avenue to mount a defense, or one to reintegrate into society. No grace, no mercy. How can we expect reason from such a movement? Social media certainly worsens the problem. The so-called interactions we have online are devoid of any real human qualities. No eye contact, no facial expression, no tones, no scope for humanizing the person you're talking to or empathizing with their position. There's the aspect of being primed to react a certain way. Think about it. When was the last time you reacted to a Facebook post yourself first and then saw the list of reactions from others? Most of the time, you're primed to react a certain way. Your mind's made up on your behalf before you even think about it. Oftentimes, our outrage is directed not necessarily to what happened in the situation, but rather to someone else's outrage. Outrage at outrage. It's a domino effect. The cycle continues. It becomes such a universal reaction eventually that not being outraged conveys a sense of social ineptitude. This recreational outrage has led to a toxic environment online that is going to need some fixing. People on the other side of the debate about cancel culture say that it either doesn't exist, or that if it does, the consequences of being cancelled are simply not as harsh as we say they are. Just look at JK Rowling, who happened to be cancelled relatively recently, and who also continues to sell book after book. Well, let's say both of those things are true. Still, the concept of cancel culture deserves to be explored at a purely conceptual level because of its consequences in society. What does it say about our collective hubris if we're offended at everything, and that the only way we're able to get our heads around that offense is by preventing the person from speaking altogether? rather than simply choosing to engage with someone else instead. And, well, 
if the people are not facing serious repercussions. Isn't that implying that society actually doesn't take this recreational outrage seriously? In their denial of the existence of cancel culture, people are inadvertently acknowledging its childishness. The complete lack of reason really shows itself when you consider the lack of reformative justice in this whole ordeal. Now don't get me wrong, I think quite a lot of the things people have been cancelled for are clearly wrong, and in a sense, I can understand. But how is it so that in almost all of those cases, there's really no path to societal reintegration? And when you're saying that they still do reintegrate into society, it's almost never a result of some carefully thought out mechanism of cancel culture. It's simply just people not caring at all about it, or simply forgetting it happened in the first place. Perhaps it's not the JK Rowlings or the Kevin Hart's of the world that are the true victims of cancel culture. Maybe it's you and me, the as yet uncanceled people, who refrain from sharing what they truly think about a policy, a politician, a video game, the burger, or restrain themselves from engaging in a debate about something that truly matters to them in fear of being cancelled for it. The unshared idea. That is the true victim of cancel culture. Of course, there's always many sides to an argument, and one of them is that cancel culture has, at the very least, caused us all to pause and reflect. Reflect on the injustices in our society that have been going on for far too long, and be more mindful of the beliefs of other people. You know, on a certain level, the debate against cancel culture is about remaining open to the possibility of being wrong. To be able to think that you and I can make some very obvious errors, Obvious errors like choosing the wrong line, even when it is clearly shorter or longer, as in the conformity experiment. If more and more people are able to internalize the idea that they too can make a bad joke and be caught off guard, or say something that they don't mean and do something bad and later in life change to become a better person, then I think we have a fighting chance against cancel culture. Because the truth is, cancel culture is not a problem that only affects one part of society. As more and more of our lives happen online, cancel culture can come for you too. It can come for all of us. It just depends on who it's convenient for at the time. At the end of the day, you'll never know when. Until it's too late. In 2013, Eric Loomis was pulled over by the police for driving a car that had been used in a shooting. A shooting, mind you, that he wasn't involved in at all. After getting arrested and taken to court, he pleaded guilty to attempting to flee an officer and no contest to operating a vehicle without the owner's permission. His crimes didn't mandate prison time, yet he was given an 11 year sentence, with 6 of those years to be served behind bars, and the remaining 5 under extended supervision. Not because of the decision of a judge or jury of his peers, but because an algorithm said so. The judge in charge of Mr. Loomis's case determined that he had a high risk of recidivism through the use of the Correctional Officer Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions Risk Assessment Algorithm, or COMPASS. Without questioning the decision of the algorithm, Loomis was denied probation and incarcerated for a crime that usually wouldn't carry any time at all. What has society become if we can leave the fate of a person's life in the hands of an algorithm? When we take the recommendation of a machine as truth even when it seems so unreasonable and inhumane. Even more disturbing is the fact that the general public doesn't know how Compass works. The engineers behind it have refused to disclose how it makes recommendations and are not obliged to by any existing law yet we're all supposed to blindly trust and adhere to everything it says. Reading about this story, a few important questions come to mind. How much do algorithms control our lives, and ultimately, can we trust them? It's been roughly 10 years since Eric Loomis' sentencing, and algorithms now have a far greater penetration into our daily life. From the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, you're constantly interacting with tens, maybe even hundreds, of algorithms. Let's say you wake up, tap open your screen and do a quick search for a place near you to eat breakfast. In this one act, you're triggering Google's complex algorithm that matches your keywords to websites and blog posts to show you answers that are most relevant to you. When you click on a website, an algorithm is used to serve you ads on the side of the page. Those ads might be products you've searched for before, stores near your location, or, eerily enough, something you've only spoken to someone about. You then try to message a friend to join you for your meal. When you open any social media app today, your feed no longer simply displays the most recent posts by people you follow. Instead, what you see can be best described by TikTok's For You page. Complex mathematical equations behind the scenes decide what posts are most relevant to you based on your view history on the platform. YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and most notoriously TikTok all use these recommendation systems 
to get you to interact with the content that their machine thinks is right for you. And it's not just social media. Netflix emails you recommendations of movies to watch based on what you've already seen. Amazon suggests products based on what you've previously bought, and probably the most sinister of all, Tinder recommends you the person you're supposed to spend the rest of your life with, or at least that night. These might seem like trivial matters, but it's more than that. Algorithms are also used to determine who needs more healthcare, and when you have your day in court and a computer program decides whether you'd spend the next decade of your life behind bars for a crime that usually doesn't carry any time. One of the most dangerous things about algorithms is the data that is used to power them, because the more data you feed into an algorithm, the better its results. And where do companies get this data? It's from their users, like you and me. Most of the time giving out this information is harmless, but a lot of times these companies sell your information to data brokers, who then sell that data to other companies that want to sell you stuff. That's why you keep getting targeted ads from random companies you've never heard of before, and what's worse is that these data brokers are often targeted by nefarious actors who steal all the information they have in data breaches. According to a report from the Identity Theft Resource Center, there were 68% more breaches in 2021 than in 2020, and that number seems to continue to go up. I'm not saying that all algorithms are bad and we should get rid of them, an algorithm is probably the reason you're watching this video in the first place. I'm saying we as a society need to make some changes to the way we currently interact and use these systems. One of the scariest things about algorithms is that they're built and altered in a black box with little oversight. The engineers behind them determine what we see and don't see. They classify, sort, order, and rank, and we don't get to know how or why. Even the government doesn't get to know how and why, and if they did, would they understand it? The engineers themselves often don't know why an algorithm behaves the way it does. They use AI and machine learning which can make the outcomes become hard to predict. They become a mystery to makers as well. When companies like Google or Facebook are challenged about their platforms after something terrible happens, they hide behind the mythos of the algorithm. They're cold, unbiased systems, they suggest. They're rational, to error is human, not machine, they claim. This is the notion of algorithms that is potentially dangerous. We think of them as pillars of objectivity, incapable of the kind of biases that corrupt human society. But are they genuinely unbiased? Are they pure instruments of rationality? As much as big tech companies would like you to believe they are, the sad truth is they are not. When the engineers choose to classify and sort, they're using pre-existing classifications which are filled with bias already, and their methods of sorting enforce biases that can have real negative consequences. In 2019, an algorithm was used on more than 200 million patients in US hospitals to determine who would need more care. Although race wasn't included in the criteria, black patients were discriminated against by the machine anyway. They were determined to require less care than white patients. How did this happen if race wasn't even an input, you might ask? Well, while race directly wasn't in the equation, previous healthcare expenses were a determining factor in deciding whether someone would need more care. And because black patients have historically spent less on healthcare, the results were that they required less care. And incorrect blanket conclusion for situations that should be case-by-case -case evaluations. Although the racial bias was unintended, it still occurred as a result of the engineer's designs. It's because of issues like these that we can't hide behind the myth of the infallible machine. Biases like these will exist in machines as long as humans are the ones building them, and there is one bias that exists in almost every algorithm we use today with far more reaching consequences. Meta, Twitter, Google, Amazon, Netflix, Tinder, most tech companies and the platforms they offer you and me as services design their algorithms to maximize one thing and one thing alone. Profit. These platforms generate revenue by primarily selling ads, and to generate more ad revenue, they try to keep you on their platforms longer because the longer you're there, the more ads you'll see and the more money they make. Take YouTube for example, there's three main things that make any video successful on the platform. Click through rate, watch time, and session time. So all YouTube cares about is, can you get people to start watching your video, and can you keep them watching for as long as possible, so we can serve them more ads. For the most part, this works as it's supposed to and people get served content they enjoy, but would have never found on their own. As with everything in life though, there are downsides. People have learned to game the system by using clickbait to lure viewers in, and then to push conspiracy theories that keep people glued to their screens whether the information is factual or not. YouTube's algorithm has also been accused of having a radicalizing effect on its viewers. 
moderate content always leads to recommendations of more extreme content which leads people down the notorious rabbit hole. You can start by watching videos about jogging, and YouTube would continue to recommend you videos that push you further slightly until one day you wake up and you're watching videos about running an ultra marathon. Facebook's algorithm shows you more content from friends whose posts you've liked or read in the past. This process slowly funnels you into a bubble where you're mostly reading the same opinions you already have, reinforcing them in your mind. The goal of this approach is, of course, to keep you on the platform longer with views you agree with. The consequence, though, is that many harmful beliefs are cemented into the heads of users on the platform instead of being challenged. The more you think about the algorithms of social media, the more they start to seem like programs for creating social problems for the sake of profit. So if that's the case, are all algorithms just evil piles of code that are determined to doom us all? Maybe, but maybe not. They do have extraordinary benefits to offer when used correctly. A dataset of 678 nuns from the Nun Study, a research project started in 1986 on the development of dementia and Alzheimer's showed something very peculiar. Researchers tried to find if they could spot any patterns in the data to suggest a relationship between something in a person's early life and the onset of these diseases later in life, but to no avail. The team also had success to the letters that the nuns wrote decades prior, when they were entering into the sisterhood around ages 19 and 20. An algorithm was able to detect an incredible accuracy through these letters, which nuns would go on to have dementia in their elderly years. This is what algorithms are great at, comparing datasets and figuring out tiny patterns that humans are more likely to miss. They're sensitive to variations in data and finding patterns that lead to reliable predictions of possible outcomes. Today, algorithms are used in detecting the likelihood of getting breast cancer and presenting better models for tackling climate change. Except the machine isn't great on its own. Every potential positive here only works with a human behind it. Algorithms can act as the first layer for screening breast cancers, but a human has to act as that necessary second layer to verify the results. Using an algorithm for determining an appropriate jail sentence might one day make sense, only if there's a human deciding whether or not the generated output is sensible or not. One of the main problems with Eric Loomis's case is that the judge didn't question the algorithm's recommendation, he simply accepted the supposed objectivity of the machine and sent a man to prison for a crime that didn't warrant it. As it stands now, we just seem to be part of this enormous social experiment being run by tech gurus. And every year or so, another social experiment is added to the mix with its own unique set of social consequences. More recently, we're discovering what a rapid stream of bite-sized videos does to teenagers or what a completely user-generated game does to tweens. So far, this video has been pretty hard on the big tech companies, but I think it's also really important to acknowledge that they are trying to address some of these issues with algorithms. YouTube, for example, has changed its algorithm to include quality and authority as measures of determining whether a video is recommended or not. Facebook has limited its targeting options to try and avoid another Cambridge Analytical scandal where user data was distributed without consent for political purposes. Are these adjustments to the algorithm helping? Yes, but not as much as necessary. Even more is the fact that these efforts point to two things. One is that human intervention in algorithms is not only necessary, but needs a much stronger presence. Two is that tinkering with the algorithm is probably not going to resolve the consequences of their most significant bias, profit-seeking. Keeping people on a platform is always going to be easier with content that sparks the most outrage. That's not always the case, of course. There is great content on YouTube and earnest viewers like you watching this video right now. But for every creator seeking to share legitimate information, there seems to be several others blatantly exploiting the algorithm for a quick buck. How can we take these platforms back from them? The sad truth is, we can't. The algorithms need to change. They need to put human welfare above profits. We need to stop designing machines that take advantage of our psychological weaknesses. To make that world possible, we need to be more critical of the algorithm. We need to dismantle the notion that the algorithm is all-knowing, objective, and rational. The black boxes need to open up, and our blind trust in these systems needs to be challenged at every turn. To paraphrase the co-founder of the Center for Humane Technology, Tristan Harris, we're all looking out for the moment when technology would overpower human strength and intelligence. But there's a much earlier moment when technology overwhelms human weaknesses. That point is being crossed right now, and it's reducing our attention spans, ruining our relationships, destroying our communities. It's downgrading humans.
On the 13th of April 2023, a 21-year-old member of the U.S. Air Force National Guard, Jax Teixeira, was arrested on live TV for leaking classified documents. Teixeira had shared classified information about the war in Ukraine with his Discord group, Thug Shaker Central, where he was the leader and administrator. This group represented everything that's wrong with Discord today, what started out as a private place for 20 to 30 young men to discuss common interests soon turned into a haven for racist and religious bigots. What's even worse is, due to the private nature of the platform, you can never know who is who. Tashira may not have meant any harm by sharing this information, it's possible he just wanted to look cool in front of his friends, but what he didn't know was that the people in that group were not his friends. Shortly after sharing the documents, they found their way to a Russian language channel on Telegram before making the rounds to the darker corners of the internet. And eventually, the New York Times reported on the story, the Pentagon launched an investigation, and the rest, as they say, is history. And it all started on Discord, an app that has become a corner of the internet that's particularly appealing to people who wish to remain in the shadows. People who want the freedom to say and do whatever they like without having to face the consequences. And while this most recent event has made Discord a popular topic on mainstream news channels, the dangers of the app run far beyond national security. Founders Jason Katron and Stanislav Vishnevsky started the company in 2015 with aspirations to turn it into a game developer studio. However, when a multiplayer game they created failed to catch on, but the communication tool around gaming became a hit, they shifted focus to the communication and messaging part of the platform. Although Discord is still mostly known for its video game communities, it's not just about gaming anymore. In fact, only 20% of Discord users report using the service strictly for gaming-related communication. So what do most people use the service for? Well, what makes Discord unique is that it brings together a lot of elements of the internet's early days. With its simple format, anonymous usernames, and real-time messaging, Discord is reminiscent of early AOL chat rooms. But it's also a place for friends to congregate, chat, and send random stuff to each other, reminiscent of the original social media platform MySpace. Unlike most other social media platforms that make money through advertising, Discord doesn't have ads. Instead, it gets revenue from its popular in-app service, Nitro, which allows users to get upgraded features like customized profiles, access to animated emojis, and larger upload capacity. On other social media platforms, the advertisers are often the ones who draw the line, because they don't want their ads running next to or associated with disturbing content. Content moderation is a necessity for platforms that earn money from advertisers, but Discord isn't one of them. This is why the app can run with those pretty loose content guidelines. The lack of content moderation can be a good thing. It allows you freedom of expression without the fear you'll get cancelled or have your account permanently banned. But when a lack of content moderation is paired with Discord's anonymity, it can quickly lead to disaster. Like its precursors from a previous generation, Discord's bread and butter is its anonymous chat rooms, but it struggles with the same question that so many social media apps face. What's more important, anonymity or transparency? Well, right now on Discord, it's anonymity. The vast majority of Discord servers are private, invite-only groups with fewer than 10 people, and even on public channels, only servers with more than 200 members are discoverable with the search tool. The app also doesn't keep a record of its audio chats, one of its most popular features, so inappropriate or criminal conversations are almost impossible to monitor. This level of anonymity is why people like the app, but also what makes it so much riskier, even for the users themselves. Scammers have found a home on Discord, relying on the alert of Nitro to swindle users of their hard-earned money. A common scam starts with a DM from an unknown contact and an offer to join Nitro for free. The scammer claims they have an extra Nitro account to give away, and all you need to do is follow a link or scan a QR code. If you click or scan, get ready to say goodbye to all your money or your personal data. And a lot of the scams on Discord involve crypto or NFT theft. In May 2022, hackers impersonating the NFT marketplace OpenSea hijacked that company's Discord server. They advertised a free NFT from an exclusive project and convinced users to connect their crypto wallets. And once the users connected their wallets, all of their NFTs and crypto were stolen. The hackers got away with about $20,000 in digital assets. Then in July 2022, Last night at about 10 p.m., my entire Discord was hacked, and thousands of people in my Discord, their accounts, were compromised by a hacker. Popular Twitch streamer Miskiff's Discord server got hacked as well. The scammers sent out offers for free Nitro upgrades to his community of 55,000 people, over 1,000 users clicked a link that took them straight to ransomware. The list goes on. Some hackers basically kidnap Discord accounts, 
holding them hostage until the ransom is paid to them. There are even accusations of hackers sending out malware via Discord to government agencies to try and exploit them. Discord has tried to curb these problems. In the space of just three months between April and June 2022, the company removed nearly 28 million spam accounts, but it's like they just can't see the forest for the trees, because all those scammers need to do is just create another account and we're right back where we started. Another area of concern for Discord and its community is the proliferation of extremist and violent groups. The nonprofit counter-extremism think tank, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, found that Discord and Steam are the worst game streaming platforms for politically radical content. And the hate doesn't just stay in the chat rooms. The young men behind the Unite the Right rally that happened in Virginia in 2017 hung out in private chats on Discord with disturbing names like the Führer's Gas Chamber. A New York Times investigation showed that they then used the app to post anti-Semitic Nazi symbols and praise the German dictator. Then they used these same Discord servers to plan logistics for the rally that left one counter-protester dead. These aren't just keyboard warriors as you'd like to assume. The app's ability to spread hateful messaging and allow those spreading it to remain completely anonymous has real-life consequences. 18-year-old Peyton Gendron, who went to a store in a predominantly black neighborhood and started shooting in 2022, discussed his plans for the shooting on Discord. He explained his motivations and described himself as a white supremacist, a fascist, and an anti-Semite. He wrote that he targeted the store because of its high concentration of black people. The New York Attorney General said that Discord and other platforms like Reddit, Twitch, and 4chan played a role in radicalizing the shooter. Discord breeds an environment where anyone, especially young people, can put their trust in unfamiliar people and dangerous ideas. Teenagers are increasingly using the app to communicate instead of texting or Snapchat. Like on other social media platforms, age verification on Discord simply doesn't work. Age restrictions are almost impossible to enforce without some major and possibly invasive action from the company, so there's no stopping from kids wandering onto servers where they'll encounter some scams or some violent rhetoric already mentioned, or worse. As crazy as it sounds, we haven't talked about the worst part of Discord. There are channels on Discord dedicated to some of the most horrific things you can imagine, whether it's sharing sexually explicit content without consent, older, disgusting perverts looking for teenagers to communicate with, or channels dedicated to encouraging self-harm or even more permanent damage. The National Center on Sexual Exploitation added Discord to its 2022 Dirty Dozen list of entities that profit from and facilitate sexual exploitation. And it's not just speculation. In March of 2023, Police rescued a 13-year-old missing girl in North Carolina after she disappeared from her Dallas home. A 34-year-old man spent months communicating with her on Discord, traveled to Texas to meet her, kidnapped, and... her. In fact, many predators on Discord used the app to convince young teenagers to leave their homes and meet in real life without telling their parents. Discord's low levels of content moderation also make sharing explicit and illegal content much easier than most other on social media. Discord's low levels of content moderation also makes sharing explicit and illegal content much easier than most other social media platforms. A 19-year-old University of Florida football quarterback was arrested in 2022 for allegedly distributing CP on Discord and admitted to being part of servers that discussed, solicited, and distributed the material. These stories are terrifying and leave many parents feeling helpless. Parents don't understand Discord as much as they do Instagram or TikTok, which many parents use themselves. The app is less intuitive for older people, learning how their child might be communicating on it isn't always clear. Even schools are at a loss when it comes to Discord. Many schools block other common social media apps, but Discord is mostly off their radar, so teenagers can use it freely even while in school. In fairness to Discord, it is trying to reduce the amount of horrific incidents happening, especially to its younger users. The app does have parental controls that can prohibit a minor from receiving a friend request or a DM for someone they don't know and it increasingly removes more and more accounts for inappropriate and dangerous behavior. The company is also investing in education for parents so that they can learn how the app works and how to set these controls for their kids. It's partnered with an organization called Connect Safely, a nonprofit dedicated to educating people about online safety, privacy, security, and digital wellness. Together, they host learning sessions with the National Parent Teacher Association to try and inform parents about the app and how they can keep their kids safe, but Many parents feel that all of this is just a performative by the company because when there is a complaint about a clear issue, even when a child is endangered, the company isn't very helpful. 
Discord does have channel moderators who enforce the company's guidelines. They investigate situations and can warn, quarantine, or ban users from the channels. Like at other social media companies, this in-house trust and safety team is there to respond to user reports. But that's the problem, isn't it? They just respond. Discord only acts if someone complains. It doesn't proactively seek out or mark explicit content. For many people, including a lot of parents, Discord's safety issues won't be resolved until the company takes more proactive steps. Now, for every horror story on the app, there are also stories of community, kids who find friends in their Discord servers when they're being bullied in real life at school, people who meet others that share their same peculiar interests. This is the beauty of the internet, it breaks down barriers, it connects us when we feel alone and it shows us worlds, people, and ideas we never would have seen or even considered before. In fact, as much as Jack Tashira, who leaked the classified intelligence information on Discord, created a dangerous and chaotic situation for the US military, the organization isn't completely disregarding the app, it's actually found ways to use it to its own benefit. The US military is facing a dire recruiting shortage and uses Discord to meet prospective Gen Z recruits. It has a 17,000 member chat room for service members to talk about first person shooter games, meet with career counselors, and take advantage of other community services. For 18 to 21 year olds who are the target for military recruitment, video games are one of the most popular forms of media. Discord is where many gamers go to see a community, and the US Department of Defense is hoping they find community and purpose in serving their country. The balance between these large entities like the military face is how they'll supervise their young workforce a workforce that lives their lives online and also has access to classified secrets. With all of the dangers of Discord, from individual safety to national security, what can be done? The Tashira leak helped open the US military's eyes to the role Discord plays in its members' lives. Special Operations Command, which oversees the most elite forces, told its members not to post anything on Discord that they wouldn't want to be seen by the general public. The Pentagon even has a guide for military officials to counsel Discord users working in the government about their personal security measures. In terms of protecting kids, most of the current proposed solutions center around how to protect children on social media in general. Currently, the legal protections for children are a patchwork of disparate laws with a lot of gray areas, loopholes, and technologically outdated mandates. For example, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act of 1998 came into effect in April of 2000 and is the only federal legislation that addresses the dangerous effects of targeted advertising on children, and we can all agree that the internet looks very different than it did in 2000. There is a bipartisan law that proposes responsibilities for tech platforms to protect children from digital harm, but it failed to make it into Congress's 2023 spending plan. Even so, Discord wasn't really a part of that conversation and still isn't looped in with other big tech companies that people usually refer to. Every social media company struggles with the same issue as Discord, the conflict between freedom and safety. You might say our entire society is struggling with it right now. Users flock to Discord because it offers what seems to be like the ultimate freedom of expression. Anonymity. But has that anonymity gone too far? Has it exposed an online landscape that's doing more harm than good? Unfortunately, Discord is still largely ignored by anyone who has the power to try and fix it. Or they just don't get it at all. Either way, we better start paying attention and understanding Discord because it's currently shaping an entire generation across the globe. And the solution isn't to just ban the app like the US Congress hopes to do with TikTok. Watch this video next to find out why that's a bad idea. In 1994, the CEO of the tobacco company R.J. Reynolds, James W. Johnston, told the United States Congress that cigarette smoking is no more addictive than coffee, tea, or Twinkies. Sure, there might be some out there who might have a steady stream of Twinkies entering their stomach, but I feel like we can all agree that despite the stomach ache and probably risk for diabetes, this sugar happy habit isn't nearly as dangerous as smoking cigarettes. For years, the tobacco industry assured customers that cigarettes weren't unhealthy or addictive and they made billions doing it. But in reality, about 480,000 Americans die every year from cigarettes, to say nothing of the global death rate. Four years after Johnston made his famously false comparison, the four largest tobacco companies reached a settlement with 46 US states to pay $206 billion over 25 years to help cover medical costs of smoking related illnesses. They lied, and now we all know why they did. While the corporate lie about cigarettes feels particularly egregious, companies, governments, and even well intentioned people lie to us in more subtle ways every single day. Think back to job interviews you might have had. You might have heard the phrase, our employees are our most valuable asset. 
and it probably feels good to hear that. You want to work at a place that values you, yet layoffs happen all the time. Sure, they're usually veiled as reorgs or some other corporate jargon to tell you that you're just no longer needed. It's not personal, it's just business. And even when you get to keep your job, salaries remain stagnant, and sometimes they even drop with the ebbs and flows of the economy. Look no further than the wave of strikes around the globe this summer, with labor unions like the United Auto Workers proclaiming, no, employees clearly aren't a company's most valuable asset. These statements by corporations are meant to make employees feel heard and respected. They're similar to statements like, your responses will be confidential when you're being asked to take a survey about the company's performance or your team. It might seem suspect. Is it really anonymous? Probably not, because companies aren't legally bound to respect statements of confidentiality. They tend to scuttle laws that force them to keep employee information private. Management at whatever level is most likely looking at whatever confidential statements you make on a survey or otherwise. Or what about meritocracy? How many times have you heard that your company or team is a meritocracy? Where the most talented, the smartest, the hardest working individuals rise to the top. It's nice to believe this because it makes us feel like if we work our butts off and develop our skills then we'll get promoted, get raises, and advance in the way we always hoped we would. But being real, whatever industry you're working in, those promotions and raises often have to do more with networking and connections than actual hard work. Sometimes the best candidates get rewarded, but in many cases it's all about who you know. Relationships you built on the job were the ones you came into the job with, so work hard, but also get connected. These kind of corporate lies are general, things companies say to keep workers happy. But then there's more specific lies, lies that are meant to persuade employees of a certain position. Companies like to make us think that our jobs are dependent on low corporate taxes, and it's true that corporate tax rates around the globe tend to be high. But even in the United States, we're at 35%. It's actually lower than a lot of other countries around the world. Corporations have developed systems of tax credits and subsidies to avoid paying that amount, or even close to it. The claim that a low corporate tax rate leads to more jobs for workers is mostly just a farce. Just like the claim that union forces jobs overseas, and yes, unions do lead to increased labor costs, but millions of non-union jobs are also sent overseas, so the problem doesn't really lie in unionization. It lies in the power of globalization. Computer programmers were never unionized, but most tech firms have moved their operations to India and China. The reality is that unions create a shift in power, away from management. In some cases, unions do create problems corruption, among other things, but when working properly, they limit and hold management accountable for the decisions that impact their employees. To demonize unions and tie it to the decline of domestic jobs is a tactic. Not a tactic to keep jobs on home soil, but to stop workers from unionizing in the first place. When we commit to a job or to working with a certain company on a project, we're usually informed of the company's core values. We get a long list of vague words like loyalty and sustainability, but What is any company's true core value? Money. In the best of workplaces, other values might follow, but money, no matter what, usually tops them all. Companies might give to charitable causes, but mostly because it improves their branding and helps with tax deductions. They'll limit their environmental impact when it improves their costs, but probably not just because they love Mother Earth so much. The use of core values is an example of the law of inverse relevancy, which tells us that the less someone plans on doing something, the more they talk about it. We all have the friend who can't stop talking about the exercise plan that they're about to start, but the question always remains, when? The fact that companies lie ultimately isn't really surprising, but seeing it in action can be a pretty wild experience. Just before we see this in action, the best way to combat misinformation is to learn how the world works. For example, by learning how AI works, we can understand when companies are hiding under that term to carry out their shady business practices. In 2020, the leaders of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google testified in front of an antitrust panel at the US House of Representatives. The goal of the panel was to poke holes in big tech's argument that they're not monopolies. The titans of the tech industry told lie after lie that we either just ignore as consumers or decide that we want to believe. Like the lie that users are in control of their data. Google CEO Sundar Pichai said that the company has simplified its settings for users, and this is true. 
They offer many privacy options, but simple isn't really a word to describe them. Just because an airplane has a lot of controls doesn't mean that anyone can fly it. The reality is that most of us have little to no understanding of what companies do with our data. They want us to think that their having access to our data creates a better experience for us. And sure, it's nice when Instagram feeds you an ad for those sneakers you've been searching for, but the data collection isn't about getting you new shoes. It's about giving companies power to make money, specifically by selling those ads. Advertising helps big tech grow, and we can all agree that they have grown. One of the claims made in this hearing was that these massive companies aren't even that big. Amazon claimed it holds less than 1% of the global retail market and less than 4% of retail in the United States, but that's counting all retail, even gas stations. I don't know about you, but I don't really consider that shopping. Similarly, Facebook claimed that it competes with all products that connect people, not just any social media companies. And Apple insisted that it doesn't have a dominant share in any market or product category. But if you have an iPhone, you know you have to go through Apple to buy apps or services on the device. Of course, it's not like the government who was listening to these claims doesn't do its fair share of lying to us as well. The US government has repeatedly lied to citizens to justify war. In 1998, the Clinton administration bombed what it told the public was a chemical weapons factory in Sudan that turned out to be a pharmaceutical factory. Then famously, the Bush administration cooked up a web of false information to convince us all that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction, the basis for the Iraq war. The most famous incident of the American government lying to perpetuate war came during Vietnam. In 1971, the Pentagon Papers were leaked and published. They showed that the government had systematically lied to cover up the fact that the United States was losing ground in Vietnam. In the 1960s, while the war was still going on, US officials insisted that the Viet Cong were dying in record numbers and that there was a light at the end of the tunnel. They called for more force, even though, as the Pentagon Papers told us, they knew the reality of what was happening, that the US was losing the war. There is, of course, a certain amount of government secrecy that's pretty much necessary for national security. False assurances aren't just for the public, they're meant to mislead adversaries and to cover up mistakes and failures that might make a country seem weak or incapable. So your government might be lying to protect you. But at what point are we supposed to believe what they say? Are we meant to think that every lie is in service of our own protection? Let's face it, a lot of the time it's about ego. Governments are filled with people, and people have too much pride to admit that they're wrong. One notable exception was in 1962, when French President Charles de Gaulle withdrew his forces from the Algerian War, understanding that France had lost the fight. But it's not just overseas that our governments have proven untrustworthy. The empty promises of political campaigns can easily convince voters to show support, but they're rarely delivered on. Politicians make promises they can't fulfill all the time. During his campaign in 1988, George H.W. Bush made the promise that he would never, ever, under any circumstances, raise taxes. And then in 1990, he admitted that fixing the economy would require tax increases. He made the promise of no new taxes, but failed to deliver. Was he lying? Probably, but that's because to make that kind of sweeping assertion is almost impossible to follow through on. But these are the kind of things that help candidates win. The other thing that can help candidates win is an environment of division. Politicians use our perceived division to stroke anger, fear, and passion. Right now we're seeing a global wave of distinct rhetoric from America to Argentina to Italy. But are we really that divided? The government and the media keep telling us that we are, but there might be a widening gap between our reality and what we're told. Members of the government might adopt extreme positions, but often average voters don't. Especially now, younger generations are resistant to supporting a political party. So is the future actually going to be as divided as many want us to think? It's easy to point fingers at the government or a large corporation for lying to us, but it gets harder when we talk about lies coming from people whose entire brands depend on helping others. But that certainly doesn't mean that lies aren't rampant throughout the self-help industry. They oversell personal empowerment, hyping up hope and creating a false sense of self-confidence among so many of us. You've probably heard the phrase toxic positivity. It's when we tell ourselves or listen to encouraging statements that are meant to minimize or eliminate painful emotions. This leads to pressure to be unrealistically optimistic without considering the reality of a situation. And the truth is that sadness, disappointment, and anger can all be pretty helpful emotions to experience. 
Positive thinking isn't necessarily bad, but if we believe that walking around thinking everything is great all the time is going to help us grow, we're probably kidding ourselves to some extent. Self-help guru Tony Robbins says that there's no such thing as failure, only results. This concept of there's no such thing as failure hits us on podcasts and books and social media posts, pushing us to ignore when we come up short. But why is failure framed as such a bad thing? Why do we have to rename or ignore it altogether? Can't failure just be failure and can't it be okay to be disappointed when you experience it? A lot of self-help guides try to sell us on financial freedom as our ultimate goal, as if working is such a horrible thing. Of course financial stress isn't pleasant, but why is being free of any sort of pressure to work such a desirable thing? The world has convinced us that we need to be living on passive income, enjoying every second of every day by the time we're 30. Success, financial or otherwise, takes time. And the journey, while difficult, doesn't have to be miserable. Don't let some online expert convince you that it will be. Often these goals or ways of viewing the world are set by gurus and experts are an attempt to make us feel that who we are and what we have isn't enough. These days we're bred on a sense of inadequacy, always striving for something different. If we don't feel we're good enough, we'll buy products that promise to make us better, healthier, prettier, and happier. It all comes back to money. But the lies from the world are, frankly, nothing compared to the lies we tell ourselves. I have to be perfect. Maybe I'll never be happy, and if I could just fix that one thing, my life would be amazing, and if I could get married, find a better job, buy a new car, or floss every day. But no one single thing is the solution to happiness. If I ignore that bad feeling, it'll go away. I don't have a choice how I spend my time, and if I had more time I would exercise, socialize, or learn to crochet. The truth is either we want to do something or we don't. It might sound fun to become a piano player, but after spending three hours learning beginner chords, you might think otherwise. I can change other people. No. No, you can't. We can, if we're lucky, help them change themselves. However, we shouldn't sign up for that either. There's no point in lying to ourselves here. People are just who they are. Including us. You and me. So no matter what your employer or your president is promising you, or what that famous podcast host or financial expert is trying to convince you of, you know who you are, and you know what you need. And you can trust yourself to root out the lies, especially the ones buried deep inside. If you're watching this right now, chances are you spent many years of your life feeling misunderstood. Maybe you coped by spending hours online or listening to pop punk alone in your bedroom, you might have wished to run away or for a simple answer that would sort out all the mixed up feelings in your head. A young person's life isn't always easy. Many teens suffer from severe anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. Compounded by school stress, relationship drama, and family pressures, mental illness during youth is intense. Thousands of young people die by suicide every year. But many more teens don't suffer from mental illness. Sure, managing school, interpersonal relationships, and growing responsibilities is challenging, but learning to deal with these struggles and becoming resilient is a part of life. So why is it that when you scroll on TikTok or Twitter, teens seem so, well, just sad? It's not just the teens, people of all ages repost memes making fun of depression or TikToks of what they ate while suffering from an eating disorder. There are highly aestheticized accounts of suffering whether earnest or ironic. Some of them make us laugh while others inspire us to sort of want these things. What's going on here? No one ever sees physical illness and thinks, I want that for myself, so why is it different with mental illness? The reality is that your perception of mental health warps how you view your own. And if it's culturally acceptable to joke about or aestheticize mental illness, it might become an alluring, sexy, or desirable condition to have. Do you ever fantasize about being mentally ill despite having no formal diagnosis? It might seem dark to admit it to yourself, but the truth is that you could be romanticizing mental illness without even knowing it. Let me be clear that the reality is mental illness ruins lives, it's messy and complicated, it strains families, makes it challenging to work, and is way more complex than a meme or TikTok can portray. So why is it alluring to flirt with the aesthetics of mental illness? I was particularly drawn to Tumblr posts in my youth because they depicted an idealized version of some dire circumstance. 
They let me see the pain in the world through rose-colored lenses. And it's not just social media, it's in film and television as well. Stories that depict mentally ill characters help us reimagine and work through our mental health struggles. Films like Girl, Interrupted, Silver Linings Playbook, and Fight Club show stories of what it's like living with mental illness and how it affects relationships with family and friends. To someone going through similar struggles, it might be relatable to see parts of your story represented on screen. For others, stories about mental health might offer you a new perspective, start a productive conversation, or open a channel for empathy. The problem though is that aesthetics will always be at the forefront of how we connect to art. Angelina Jolie and Jennifer Lawrence are stunning Hollywood actresses. Tyler Durden of Fight Club represents a male ideal that some might strive for. This is how the media makes us romanticize mental illness by making it more attractive and desirable than it really is. And when you glorify mental illness, you convince yourself to believe a situation is better than it is in reality. Think about the lives of some of the world's most famous artists. Marilyn Monroe was a beautiful movie star and one of the greatest actresses of all time. Her struggles with eating disorders, pill addiction, and depression are a part of her tragically glamorous story. Culturally, her mental illnesses are linked to her iconic status. In public memory, her beauty and her pain are intertwined. As a result, all the parts of her life are romanticized, even the less romantic elements. And what about Kurt Cobain, the lead singer of the 90s grunge band Nirvana? His music gave voice to a generation as he made art about what it was like living with depression and addiction. His death by suicide in 1994 solidified his icon status in the music world. His death is part of his legacy as an artist and how he died provides a lens through which we can look at the art he made while he was alive. We see his genius as inseparable from his mental illness. Vincent van Gogh follows a similar pattern. He spent most of his life painting in obscurity out of the public eye. Only after his death did the public learn about his mental illness and start associating that with his creativity. Whether it's drunken nights in Paris or the infamous cutting of his ear, the public's understanding of masterpieces such as Starry Night and Sunflowers is tied to Van Gogh's mental health struggles. It endears people to his story and transform him into a tragic genius of sorts. The intersection of mental illness and art is a prime example of romanticization. We look up and admire artists who create work we love, we assume their mental illnesses offer them clairvoyance and the unique ability to create magnificent art. That's why so many young artists believe they must suffer to be like the greats, who subconsciously wish mental illnesses upon themselves in hopes that it would help them create better art. Today it's no longer just artists creating masterpieces that paint a pretty picture of mental illness, it's everyone who has a camera and an internet connection. There's this phenomenon called thinspo where people suffering from eating disorders post pictures of their starved bodies online along with diets to inspire others to achieve a similar look. In the same vein, people post aestheticized pictures of self-mutilation in an attempt to encourage others to do the same. All you have to do is scroll through any social media platform to find countless seemingly harmless memes about wanting to die to recognize that deteriorating mental health is a popular topic of conversation among people. Before the internet, these feelings had no outlet to be aired publicly. They only happened alone or among small groups of friends, if at all. Now not only do they have an outlet, but they have the distribution to reach millions of people in an instant. And it begs the question, is the online discourse surrounding mental health productive, or is it distorting the reality of those who struggle daily? The truth is that romanticization of mental illness is not black or white. It can be destructive, yes, but it also has its benefits. It seems contradictory to reframe suffering and mental anguish as desirable, it sounds more logical to want a happy life, free of anything that could get in the way of the ultimate contentment. Why would you like to invite suffering? Isn't that something you would want to cast away? It makes total sense on paper, but the reality is that suffering is a part of life, whether we want it or not, and spinning it as something noble, exciting, or cool can genuinely help people get through these issues. This is what romanticization helps with, you convince yourself that you're mysterious, edgy, or aloof instead of socially anxious or depressed. Instead of feeling like an outcast, you become a rebel, championing the fight against the status quo when you take your pain and turn it into an identity that gives you social credibility. Romanticization allows your situation to feel acceptable, loved, or even coveted by mainstream society. You regain a sense of total control and power when you feel powerless. When you romanticize, the narrative of your life is in your own hands and you can reframe your suffering however you please. 
In a moderate and controlled environment, I don't see a massive problem with some light romanticization of mental illness. Even when life feels the worst, there can still be funny, enjoyable, and beautiful moments. And finding joy in those moments amid your struggle or trying to see your situation through a different perspective can help you get through it. There's been a positive push towards destigmatizing mental illness in recent years. As a culture, we're trying to eradicate the shame historically associated with mental illness. And people are more willing to honestly discuss their struggles and receive treatment when necessary. While this is a positive step forward, the conversation about mental health has become too ordinary in some ways. It's essential to have open and honest conversations about mental illness, but if, by definition, romanticism misrepresents mental illness, how is honesty possible? Can true healing happen in a society with some romantic outlook on mental illness? The worst thing about romanticization is when it's done by people who are not mentally ill, but wish to be. Those who take on the aesthetic of mental illness without understanding the real pain it actually causes people. Some people make a particular condition the cornerstone of their content and turn symptoms into fun little quirks that their young fans might start to mimic without knowing how damaging it can be in the long run. Content posted by teenagers in their bedrooms now serves a similar function to the representation on TV and in movies. Only now viewers can access it on their phone while in bed, waiting for the bus or during downtime in class. And the problem is that consuming too much mental health oriented content can lead to self-diagnosing or identifying with a mental illness that you don't clinically have. It's a form of mimetic desire, which are desires we mimic from the people or culture around us. People might feel an average amount of sadness and think they're depressed. Mood swings are explained by bipolar disorder. Neatness and particularness turn into OCD and difficulty focusing on a specific task becomes an ADHD diagnosis. The genuinely undesirable symptoms are often left out of these fantasies. With severe depression comes suicidal ideation, bipolar disorder makes it challenging to have a steady job or healthy relationships, some people with OCD find it hard to leave the house and struggle with crippling anxiety. The reality of ADHD isn't fun or cute, it often leaves people feeling overwhelmed and overstimulated by even the smallest daily tasks. Think about the countless hours spent in therapy, the prescription drugs and sometimes hospitalizations some people endure to manage their mental illness. When we romanticize mental illness, we undermine the seriousness of certain mental conditions. The public has become very familiar with mental health vocabulary and symptoms which, on the one hand, helps with early diagnosis and encourages people to seek help, but on the other hand, this familiarity has given everyone a false sense of authority about the topic. People start to diagnose not just themselves, but their followers, and labeling and categorizing human behavior might explain why you act the way you do. And that's not satisfying, it takes away the mystery behind your quirks or life struggles. But when it's not done under the supervision of a healthcare provider, it can lead to serious issues. We've learned not to google our symptoms when we have physical health issues because it just says you have cancer. So why do we do the same when we have mental health issues? Look at the online discourse and see how blurred the line between mental health and mental illness is. Like physical health, mental health is something everyone must maintain, but just because you struggle with your mental health doesn't mean you're mentally ill. Conflating the two minimizes the suffering someone with a diagnosed mental illness has to go through daily. Romanticizing mental illness is a misrepresentation of the whole story. It's best to maintain a neutral stance when engaging with that topic. Try being the key word here. Because the truth is mental illness will always be complicated and messy, it changes human behavior, and productive conversations do not compartmentalize neatly, which is why, to an extent, romanticization might be inevitable. It's human nature to spin a situation to be more desirable or attractive. And knowing this, how do we reset our mindset when influenced to maintain some neutral stance when discussing mental health? Well first, you must give yourself a reality check on what mental illness means and how it affects people. It's not always just manically cleaning the house, it's ugly, gritty, and gets in the way of relationships. It's not cute, quirky, or fun, it genuinely destroys lives. Remind yourself that it's unethical to appropriate the aesthetics of mental illness for this reason, wearing the mask without understanding the pain hidden beneath it. Recognize that most aspects of people's mental health journey remains private. Behind closed doors, you don't know people's struggles. So it's crucial to delve into the nuances and complexities of dealing with mental illnesses and steer clear of an overly romantic outlook. 
Then, and only then, can you flirt with romanticism occasionally, instead of using it as a lens through which to interpret mental illness as a whole. Behind me are 100 people, and they range from the age one all the way through. Please, it's time for the <laughs> This is Bobby Pig. YouTube feels boring now. Those were the exact words my friend said to me as we talked about the current state of the platform. I asked him why he felt so and he said, everything feels so polished, so commercialized, and it seems like all the creators are doing is chasing the algorithm. It's getting tiring. I agreed that YouTube felt boring now, but he didn't really like what I said next. I told him that it's as much the audience's fault as it is the creators. And this is what I mean. I noticed a recurring phenomenon while scrolling through YouTube a couple years ago. Several videos presented in my home feed were about the same thing. They all had slightly different clickbait titles and thumbnails with an image of a person reacting to the headline. And the topics were mostly generic. Often they addressed cultural phenomena, historical events, or what's behind a meme. You might remember all the videos a couple months ago about why men think about the Roman Empire all the time. There's nothing wrong with being topical, but channels have become limited in what we can discuss. We're no longer free to follow our interests. This is a cycle I see relentlessly. The algorithm pushes a trending topic to my YouTube homepage. The same channels cover these topics, and the only new channels that pop up on my homepage are channels that are also covering these same topics. If you watch one of these things, YouTube will feed you more. Before you know it, you're drowning in videos about how Ticketmaster is ruining your life. Which reminds me that I should probably cover that at some point. And then there's the Mr. Beast phenomenon. That's like what I just described, but in hyper mode. The basic premise of most of his videos is that he finds an extreme, entertaining way to spend money charitably. Each video tries to capitalize on something popular like Squid Game. In order to drive clicks, the topics are extreme and the videos are so fast-paced that there's no room for you to breathe, never mind clicking off. By doing this, he's achieved the holy grail of YouTube video success, a high click-through rate, which is the number of total people who click on your thumbnail and a high watch time which is the total number of time people spend watching your video. Mr. Beast's incredible success has inspired an army of clones that imitate his model and the challenges in his videos. Within days of Mr. Beast posting a video, you'll see many similar videos from the imitators he spawned. Whereas many popular YouTube channels chase trends, these channels chase one creator. The result is a distinct lack of variety and originality. So what exactly is going on here? Why are entertainment and even educational YouTube channels chasing trends at a dizzying level? And is that ultimately a problem? An incredible number of videos get uploaded to YouTube daily, almost 3.7 million. Without a filter, YouTube would just be a wall of noise, you'd have to rely solely on search to find things that interest you. People would likely abandon the platform frustrated that it was hard to find anything, or it would only be suitable for its helpful tutorials and other types of videos that you'd routinely search out. To prevent this from happening, YouTube created an algorithm. The YouTube algorithm is very complicated and almost impossible to fully understand, but for the sake of this video, here's what you probably need to know. In the early days of YouTube, the algorithm was optimized for clicks and views. Any video that quickly garnered attention would be spread even further across the platform. A lot of memorable videos came from this era. Animated shorts were big and often the first videos to be shared when people gathered around a desktop computer. But this algorithm wasn't perfect. In fact, it was really easy to exploit with misleading titles and thumbnails. This is when clickbait originated. People would use the most extreme titles and thumbnails to get viewers to click, and the video would be nothing like what was promised. Because of this, people started getting frustrated with the platform, so around 2012, YouTube changed its algorithm to put more emphasis on watch time. This gave longer form content an enormous advantage and gave rise to what is regarded as the golden era of YouTube. Channels that made engaging longer videos like vloggers, gaming videos, and video essay channels like the one you're watching gained massive popularity. Completion time also became a factor. Some channels gravitated to shorter videos with better completion rates or longer videos with better watch time. Conspiracy videos took off in this framework as they tended to hook viewers for longer periods of time, and viewers would usually watch to completion. YouTube responded by adjusting the algorithm towards satisfaction, giving extra weight to metrics like shares and likes. They eventually targeted misinformation and content to reduce the impact of conspiracy videos and misinformation. The channel's authority score helped determine whether they were a reliable source of information or tinfoil hat nonsense. 
This score takes into account the number of subscribers, videos, views, quality, and more. These days, YouTube considers viewer satisfaction, authority score, watch time, number of views, trustworthiness of content, and the particular history of a given user in the algorithm. There's a lot more that goes on behind the wall of the algorithm that no one, not even YouTube's employees, can really understand. To make it even more confusing, the algorithm changes constantly, and this is where the problem begins. Because the algorithm is constantly changing, creators like me are continually chasing trends without a reliable sense of how our videos might perform. The same type of video might result in millions of views one week while bringing in a few thousand the next. One feature that should prevent this problem is the subscribe button, and at one point it did. Once you subscribe to a channel, you would be served all the videos that that channel made. But for some reason that's not the case anymore. Now when you subscribe to a channel, you won't necessarily see many of their videos on your YouTube homepage. You're more likely to see Mr. Beast's big grinning face than the thumbnail of a channel you love. Like this one, right? Right? Before changes in the algorithm, having a lot of subscribers came with the benefit of regularly high viewership. That meant that creators didn't need to chase trends, they could just put out what they thought was good content and their subscribers would see it. It allowed for more flexibility on what they could cover. If a topic seemed important to them but wasn't exactly popular, they could still produce a video about it. Maybe their audience would learn something important that they wouldn't have otherwise. The problem was that newer channels struggled to gain any footing. This wasn't great for YouTube's growth or for channel diversity. As a result, we're now in a state where the content reflects what the algorithm wants, so how is this your fault? While content reflects what the algorithm wants, what the algorithm wants is basically a representation of what the audience wants. And basically, audiences want something, the algorithms become aware of it, and the creators respond to the algorithm's awareness. There's little to no room for content to flourish outside of the immediate desires of the viewers. But this problem goes beyond YouTube. Every social media platform is continually trying to feed you content that immediately catches your interest. The content you're more likely to click or pause on is given priority in your feed. A personal update from a close relative will be regulated to the bottom, while an acquaintance posting a controversial meme gets regular placement at the top of your feed. Whatever keeps you on the platform longer. We're increasingly less exposed to things we don't immediately want. We're not given content that isn't suited to our specific desires at the moment. Videos that may take some patience to get into aren't coming across our feed. What does this ultimately mean for educational content? Right now a lot of educational videos chase the algorithm, but sooner or later, the algorithm might leave them behind. They may not be gratifying enough for the audience. In the many incarnations of state-run television, there are requirements for the content to be either educational or news-focused. For a long time, countries like Norway and Italy primarily had public television. In 1981, cable television was introduced in Norway. The content was far less educational. It was mainly entertainment, and the result was that teenagers and young adults dramatically cut back on reading. This actually impacted IQ scores with an average two-point decline. In areas of Italy with greater access to cable television, adults had cognitive scores equal to four IQ points lower. Plato thought art should be regulated so that it didn't corrupt the youth or weaken their character. That's an extreme, but it does point to the fact that the media we consume plays a huge role in defining our character. Why would we ever put up with anything educational if we're so used to instant gratification from a stream of algorithm-driven content? Would we discover new and exciting art if we're drip-fed what we want now? Would you discover the music of a remote culture? Would you learn about ancient philosophy? I'm not so sure. At least not online. And what kind of effect does algorithm chasing have on kids? A lot of YouTube is intended for children, and many of whom have their own tablets. On the platform, they're fed video after video designed to hold their attention as long as possible. They don't have to put up with anything that isn't instantly stimulating. There is some educational content for kids, but a lot of what they're shown is entertainment. They'll watch streamers play Roblox, a game that's also been created and tweaked to keep kids playing for as long as possible. They're inundated with layers of stimulating content to keep them busy. They get accustomed to instant gratification and fewer opportunities to exercise patience. In 1969, the educational kids show Sesame Street premiered on television. The show was intended to help kids develop emotional numeracy and literacy skills. Kids who watched the show showed clear signs of learning. Control groups showed a 5-point increase in IQ over kids from similar families who didn't watch the show. Even though Sesame Street is a TV show and not the activity of reading a book, it was still able to have a positive impact on the intelligence of the kids who watched it. But Sesame Street didn't have to program itself for an algorithm. 
I didn't have to skip an episode on the letter A all the way to the letter X because other channels were thriving with X content. There's a real impact to chasing audiences' tastes so closely, and it might make us dumber, less interesting people. It may also make life for content creators some strange, lucrative hell. Many individual creators have reported feeling extremely burnt out chasing the algorithm. And it's true. You as the audience still have some agency in all of this. With some discipline, you can resist the allure of the algorithm. You can find channels you love, subscribe to them, and check in regularly. Ignore the wall of videos designed by an uncaring algorithm. Watch videos outside your interests. Search for content about the process of building a trombone or how bats sleep. Keep growth alive and have patience for the less immediately interesting. Because overstimulation just might be ruining your life. Watch this video next to find out how and how to fix it for good. Once upon a time, there 